3,000. Right, my name is Maloney. This is the 3,000 Podcast. I'm joined today by a very well-respected rapper, producer, and label owner, Checkmate. Thanks for coming, man. Thanks for having me. Is that a uh, fitting introduction, do you think? Is that how you describe yourself? It's fine, yeah. I mean, I, I try not to describe myself too much. That's, it's, yeah. always not, it's always a pleasure and an honor to hear what people have to say, especially if it's a nice thing to hear. So it's a hard good. thing for an artist to do, isn't it? Write a bio about themselves. It's fucking hard. It's the worst. Someone yeah. asked me just a few weeks ago for one for a show, and I was like, after all these years, I, I was like, I probably need to take a good week to write a bio, but I couldn't. I just was like, I don't know where to start. It's hard because, like, hip hop is such an industry where you big up yourself, but then if you got to sit down and write about yourself like that, it makes it hard. Like, it does. on a track, you can say fucking this and that, but then if you're going to sit down and write it and send it out as a press release, you're like, oh, it's a bit daunting. It is. It is, and the the longer you're doing it for, the less you want to do something like that the more humble you become over time, or at least for me. Well, I think yeah. age, you know, that sort of thing comes with age and you don't have the young, angsty, I'm better than everybody else sort of attitude. yeah. Um, but also coming from, I know a lot of DJs that have been in the scene for a long time, mm-hmm. you don't want to say, I've had 40 years experience because then you sound like an old cup. Yeah, you know you what I mean? Yeah, you age yourself pretty so, quick for sure. So it's a bit of a balancing act, that whole <laughs> intro stuff. But um, let's talk about, Look, we always start at the start, and I know you didn't grow up in Melbourne. I believe you grew up in Canberra. I did. And what was that like, man? Like, obviously, it's a small place, but I guess you're a big fish in a small pond growing up there. Mm. Not that many other kids into hip-hop early days, or? Mm, I mean, they're, 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 no, not really. I mean, they were, but they were in pockets, so you'd sort of have to find them, and that, that was the thing. Once I sort of encountered hip-hop, I think it started when I, like, through skateboarding, I was at the Woden Skate Park, and then there was, I think it was, pretty sure it was Seth from KOA, and he was painting the squash courts across the road, and there was all the guys from KOA that were in town as well, from Sydney. And I was just like, what are you guys doing? And they were like, doing graffiti. I was like, what's that? Can you do it to my board? <laughs> yeah. So they tagged up my board, and then I was like, oh, yes, yeah, sick official artwork on my board, you know, and that was it. I was hooked from there there on in and then just hearing the music and that's what got me into it, I suppose. But yeah. It's it's hard for kids now to even comprehend mm. people of our vintage that when you would hear something like that, you couldn't instantly fucking chase it down. Yeah. Like I'm guessing in Canberra, there's no purpose made hip hop store, you know. You've got to go find whatever hip hop they've got at fucking sanity or whatever. Yeah. There was there was a hip hop shop that there was. New Sense opened. Yep. When he moved back there, him and another writer from Canberra opened it, and that lasted probably about three years. There is a store there now called Sancho's Dirty Laundry, which mm-hmm. sells paint and hip hop ish sort of stuff, but as well as you know street art and just other things. Mm-hmm. So it's it broadly encompasses the culture, yep. but there there isn't specifically there definitely wasn't back then. No. There was you know there was record stores where you could listen to thirty seconds of a song at a time. That was it. Mm. and they had it cut off I remember they had the automated CD player and it cut off after 30 seconds yeah so if you find if you hear something that you like then you've got to like fucking really chase it down yeah. I'm guessing you're going to have to go to one of the biggest cities to find that sort of stuff yeah for sure I mean like my local news agent had um, Hype magazine when I was younger which was strange that they managed to have it in there and that I, I, I didn't have the money to buy it so I'd just be standing there reading it and then they tell me I had to leave because I wasn't buying anything. And then it got onto the source mag and that. It's funny because it's like I I just mixed a song recently where Bigfoot was doing a verse on it, and he had this line where he it's I can't remember the the, the lead in, but the punchline was Big L died. It took us six months to find out. Mm. That's just so real. It that's, is. Man. Yeah. That's what it was like. Now you know song. everything. You know if someone's stubbed their toe over in the States, but yeah. back then you didn't know anything. And he found that out through a friend who had friends over in the States or was in contact with people and it filtered through after six months. And that just, when I heard that lyric, I was like, 
so real. But... Yeah, and it's hard. For, I think it's hard for kids to comprehend that. Yeah, now we live in such a time where anything you want to fucking find out about, you jump on YouTube, you can find out, yeah. and you're over it in a second. 100%. But back in those days, I'm tipping that you had to fucking catch a train or a bus or something to Sydney yeah. to go and try and find this music yeah. that you heard in a boombox. Hundred percent. And mm. like even even with Graf, you'd you'd hear on the grapevine that so and so did a piece somewhere in Canberra, and then you'd have to pack a lunch, catch a bus, navigate going there without bumping into that graph rider who was probably going to beat you up for going near their piece. Mm -hmm. It was it was it was different yeah. times, you know. And with no I'm presuming there's no train lines in Canberra. No, nah, there's one train that goes from Canberra to I think it goes to Sydney and then on to Adelaide, so it's the So there's not train. that many walls or sort of public spaces like that, is there? Like that you could now there is, but the it was a, it was the bus line that yeah. everyone went on. So it was all public spots right on the main streets that everyone would be painting. Mm -hmm. So it's that, yeah. The, and what what words were you were you writing in the early days? It's actually funny. Um, my my father and my brother just came to town to visit on the weekend, and my dad brought this big folder of all like my report cards and everything from when I was a kid, and all my like little arrests sheets and stuff like that from when i was a kid and the first tag i had was um was drake originally and that was because there was two guys that used to write drows and deost on my bus line and i just just i didn't know what it was mm -hmm. but i just saw these tags everywhere with started with d and i thought oh if you're gonna do this it has to start with d and i didn't know what biting was yeah and that's how i found out the hard way and then before i knew it i had these guys wanting to beat me up because i was writing something that sounded like one of their tags yeah because i didn't know and i got i got arrested as a kid for tagging a war with drake and then the, the even the other day i saw in that rokes was something that i used to write so that was funny. Yeah. Was, so, yeah, and that's cool. I guess you don't have people that you can look up to to say, hey, mentor me through this shit. I guess you go to the skate park mm. only when the kids from Sydney come that you can see that. So there's no older cats at the skate park. You can say, teach me how this fucking works. Or yeah. Can school you on it? It definitely wasn't like that. When you'd meet someone, it was, hey, you're a toy. Yeah. And then you'd basically have to defend your honour. And then if you stood up for yourself, they'd be like, oh, you're all right. So it was it was a funny one. Like you sort of had to punch on with someone or have beef with someone in order to be legit in the scene. At least when I was coming up, it was like that. Because if you were tagging, everyone else knew, oh, who's this new, new kid on the block? Mm. So then eventually you'd cross paths because there's only so many buses you're going to catch. Yeah. And tag is always tagging so and you can spot if you're doing it you can see the other kids you can just look at them what they look like you know, and you can, you're like this 100 yeah. percent. the way they wear their hats the shoes they Everything, wear 100 yeah. percent. yeah so you knew that that was it so then where were you going to sydney or melbourne or where were you going where were you where did you think i need to go to find this to scratch this itch of like fucking graffiti sydney, hip hop culture yeah. sydney was where it was once i once i sort of got like more into it and was repping with other people We'd sort of go to Sydney on missions. That was that was more anything else. So we sort of cut our teeth in Canberra and then went to Sydney, and that's kind of where we met a few other people who take us out and paint. And it was more welcoming there a little bit, or you just a bit older. You've honed your style, so people are fucking accepting you more into it. I mean, it was welcoming with the people that you met there, mm -hmm. but you know, it was this. It was the same thing, but on a very grand scale because you just didn't know. Like for me, it was amazing because it was from out of town. I'm like, oh wow, that, I've seen that in Hype magazine, and I've heard rumors, and you know, you hear myth, myths about certain writers, and you go, oh wow, I can't believe I'm actually looking at that piece I saw in this magazine or whatever. But it's like, at the same time, you don't necessarily be wanting to bump into. Mm people you don't know and then going on a rider because you don't know how it's going to go especially if it's in canberra and you're probably going to end up getting in a dust up with someone for yeah, looking at their piece then in sydney yeah it it's might interesting be the same, how it's you know? not like we're like-minded you like graph i like graph let's sort of link up it's mm. straight away like fucking let's yeah. let yeah yeah it's an ego driven culture yeah. of misfits you know so well it, yeah, it totally is but you'd think that even with like skateboarding it's obviously a little bit misfit ish yeah for sure but people tend to sort of link together yeah. and like let's fucking go skating together yeah you know rather than being combative about the situation yeah well i mean they'll call you a grommet until 
used to i that's what i always encountered like even when i like because i used to skate originally and that was what led me on to hip-hop eventually mm -hmm. but i remember when i was young skating that the older skaters would diss me but then if i kept at it they wouldn't diss me so much mm. and then they'd be like you're all right come skate with us yeah You've oh wow you can stripes. do that's yeah. it you know and it's that's how it, it that's the same same really? element with graph that's what i found like if you stood up for yourself and you're like no nah, this is what i'm gonna do mm. then people were more they were like oh that he's about it yeah. rather than because i saw a lot of people get checked yeah. and uh, in their time they're like yeah this isn't for me mm. and they went on to do whatever but that's they wanted how to they, do you with know? skate that's how they vet kids right so you must get a lot of kids you're in a skate park and you're there every day with your boys or whatever and mm. then you get some kids that come and try it for one fucking school holidays and then they're never there again but if you keep coming back they say oh this guy's actually into it that's you start it. learning some kick flips or some shit yeah. they're like all right you're okay yeah. you're in the fucking club you know that's what i mean it. some some people want to do the kick flips but once they scrape their knee they realize it's not for them yeah. you know? and as someone who loves skating i gotta ask when you said you used to skate what was do you remember your first like proper skateboard that you got like you must have been hyped on like i think it was an omni yeah right I think it was an omni board and it was one of those ones that had a bit more of a point at the end yeah so, so we're I'm... talking like early 90s yeah 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 like a, oh, man i had some cool boards i can't remember the name of all of them i had a I had a natus coopus or natus coppus natus yeah. coppus board yeah. and I, I so with like the panther I think it was the yeah. one with the Panther. Yeah. yeah. I've so, got one of them at home, man. Like, just a right. reissue. But, yeah, that was that artwork was fucking mm. awesome. Yeah. And I think maybe a Bones Brigade, a Power Perelta board. But, yeah. I can't remember all of them, but I'm, from memory, the Omni board was the first that I had. Yeah. And then you'd see other boards that people had, and you're like, I want to get that one. Board, yeah. Yeah, but I was more a ramp skater. Right. So yeah. I couldn't do – like, the when, when everyone had, like, the – um. The more loose trucks. Yeah, you got to tighten them up. Yeah, yeah I was all so about you can the get tight the rock trucks. To I used to have tight trucks too, man. Yeah. And then you can't carve though. That's the thing. Yeah. So you can. It's fine on a quarter pipe on a mini, but if you start, cut, you got it. Yeah. That's it. I was good on the mini ramps. I, I could even skate vert. I remember dropping in on a vert ramp and doing a like a, a rock to fakey tail stall, mm -hmm. going back in. I was all right at it, but then when I try and do stuff on on the street just didn't have the chops for it like yeah. other people were real good at it and i was like yeah i'll stick to ramps and then i had an injury where i busted my teeth and that was kind of like oh i don't know if i'll skate much from that you yeah. know and then from there got more into hip-hop music and, and that graph sort of and stuff. shit like that yeah but it, it's cool that you you obviously back in the day it was all you did the the all the elements of of hip-hop where mm. now it seems to be like people are focusing which is fine because mm. it, it, it's it's evolved mm. but people were like well if you do mc you still do graffiti you still break you still do dj sure, you know yeah. what i mean which yeah. is cool because i feel like that sort of part of the whole culture is lost a little bit now for sure I, I used to rock around with the linoleum mm -hmm. and mr sheen yeah. and like other peeps and we'd go breaking and we we had like cardboard that we'd gaffer tape together and spray up with Mr. Sheen and be it was always like part of what we were doing. Yeah. I wasn't a great break dancer but I loved the because when I when I was a kid I did gymnastics. Mm -hmm. So I was a bit it acrobatic toward, already, yeah. you know. Yeah. And then and obviously you do your martial arts as well. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I guess did you start that at a young age or is that something you did a little bit older in your teen sort of years? I, well, I, I I grew up watching Monkey Magic, mm -hmm. so I loved it, and I wanted to learn martial arts. Like channel two every the every best, night. Yeah. you know. I was I was hooked on it, and then Ninja films. I loved Ninja films, but I always wanted to learn, and I actually didn't. But then when I got into graffiti, I realized I had to learn how to fight if I was going to keep doing graffiti because mm -hmm. there was other guys in graffiti in Canberra that wouldn't pretty good fighters yeah so that's why i got into martial arts eventually but i always wanted to do it i just didn't have mm -hmm. the funds to do it or the means so then it, when it became more of a necessity and i was like well i've got to be able to defend myself because you hear this so and so he knows this so if i don't learn something i'm gonna get in trouble and i remember actually getting like almost getting beaten up by that same dude who's now like one of my best mates mm -hmm. and like a, a mutual friend at the time like i i remember doing a tag 
and he saw me do the tag and he rocked up and just capped it right in front of me. Just and as then, a, like to blatantly disrespect. Yeah, just to, he's like, ah, oh, this toy like that. And he was pissed. And, and then I was like, oh man. And I was like, oh, I had to say something. So I was like, well, what are you doing? That's my, and he's like, oh yeah, you want to go? And he starts like slapping me and I was like and trying he's to defend than you myself. At this stage, yeah, he's two years bigger and he was formidable. Yeah. You know, I didn't want him, I didn't want a piece of him, but I, I didn't want to be a chump, you know? So I was like, what are you doing? Like that. And then he's, he's like, slap me. And then gone to like, gone to knee me, and I sort of blocked the knee. And then our mutual friend, who was, a, you know, was better friends with him, but liked me, you know. And he sort of broken it up, and then pushed him away and go, I'll leave him alone. He's just a kid. And then he's pulled me aside, and he just goes, "This is always going to happen to you if you don't learn to defend yourself." Yeah. And he goes, "You should go train here." And maybe you'll be able to defend yourself. So he was, you know, and that dude was the same guy who, basically. G'd me up to get a sound engineering certificate. Yeah, right. So he's the reason I moved to Melbourne. Melbourne. Yeah, okay. So it was interesting. And then as everything became full circle, I became best mates with the guy that yeah. tapped my tag and wanted to slap me anyway. <laughs> we never ended up having a fight. Yeah, you know? but it's interesting because, like, you get into martial Look, I'm, I don't do it, but I'm just thinking. You get into martial arts because of the physical side of it, mm. but I guess you learn a lot more and you probably took out a lot more of it than the physical shit. 100%. You, uh, you just learn to be confident in who you are discipline and you at the end you're really learning to defeat yourself so it's mm. like and you learn like you can learn how to fight but if you really get into it you're learning how not to fight yeah so yeah. it's like well okay cool you can say what you want about me cool i'm not gonna try and throw a punch just because you said some mean words like if you try and hit me different story I'm, that's when we'll engage but if you're confident in your ability then you don't need to let your ego drive. Mm -hmm. And that do you find mind. that if you're not practicing the martial arts that you lose a little bit of it or is it something that you'll always sort of have? I mean, phys the physicality of it, you lose flexibility if you're not maintaining your stretching. You, you do forget certain stuff, but it's like, it's the beauty of it is that a lot of it, you're learning movements and understanding what those movements are. So if you're not actually physically training them, you can still be thinking about how it is. Like you watch the Kung Fu films and it's like there'll be the, the scene where the guy's fighting in his mind before they actually fight and he's running the techniques and it's kind of like that. But if you don't actually train and train to fight, then you're not you're not going to be able to do And you it. can apply those techniques to all sorts of other stuff, I guess music production and anything, just discipline and learning the craft and all that sort of yeah, shit. Yeah, 100%. Consistency is, is the key to all of it. Yeah. You know, and discipline to be able to make it happen. Yeah. So when you so you talked about moving to Melbourne. Had you had you made tracks in in Canberra before you moved to Melbourne? You started to yeah. do DIY sort of home studio setup stuff. Yeah, I had the eggshell cartons on the yeah. on, on the wall and everything. They stank. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We went in, man. Like me, me and my mate, the same guy who who yeah. capped my tag. When we became friends, that's when we started. He goes, I've got this great idea for a rap crew because we had one crew that we called the three-story empire and then someone else was like, why don't you call it the four-story empire? I think DJ Weapon said that. Call it the four-story empire. And then we had a logo that was like the Fantastic Four logo. Yeah, so yeah. everyone in the crew had that together. Yeah. And then my mate was like, let's work on this out. Let's let's call our crew Hospice to Infinitum. And I was like, what, do you, what does that mean? He explained what a hospice was. Mm. And he's like, to infinitum means forever, like yeah. ill forever. Yeah. And that's kind of where the concept of it was. So we were making tunes on a, what was it? I mean, I used to have like a cassette deck and I'd play drums through that and then play that tape back through onto another tape while playing another instrument and then re-record. It was just terrible. By the end of it, it was just hiss. Mm. Just so much tape hiss. And then a guy who actually was a skater, his name was Wombi. I think he still skates. He was running a um, a shop up in Adelaide a few years back, but he ended up swapping something. I think he had a four track recorder, so we swapped it for a DJ mixer that we'd gotten. Mm -hmm. And then that's when I started doing four track recordings on the tape. And then th that's the funny thing when I started doing sound engineering, the whole thing was to get rid of the hiss on my tapes. Mm. That's what I wanted to do. Dude, yeah. And then once I learned about all these different recording techniques i was like you don't even need to use cassette tapes anymore like, no nah. but i mm. guess there is i back then you you're listening to what other you're trying to emulate what you're hearing from the u.s i guess mm. a lot of it and so you think well and a lot of it has that sort of 
dirty, grimy kind of hissing mm. kind of sort of sound to it, but you don't want it too much, though, yeah. I guess. And it's like also, it's like you, you want it to sound as bassy as that stuff that you've been listening to, but then when you're using like a, a Pioneer cassette deck and you just turn up the bass on the equaliser on that and you think that's going to cut it, it doesn't cut it. And it's yeah. like, that's what I mean. When you actually learn all the processing that goes into getting those sounds, like I often wonder, like hearing the original demo recordings of like some of the classic albums I grew up listening to, I'd, I'd love to get my hands on those before the engineer worked them to see what they sounded like just out the box or, yeah. you know, because I'm sure that they went through numerous processes in those studios because yeah. you can see the photos of what the, you know, what the artists would yeah. were in, in those studios and you're like, oh, yeah, now I know what those pieces of gear are and what they would have done with them. So it would be real interesting to hear, like, say, Mob Deep's yeah. first album before it went through the engineer shine. Because I guess that's what was so different about Wu-Tang when they came out is it did mm. sound like they were demos, you know yeah. what I mean? Like it didn't yeah. sound like it was production. It sounded like yeah. it was made DIY, yeah. and that's what made it so cool because everything was so polished, yeah. and then this sounds so grimy. The griminess of yeah. it was crazy. It was, that was it. Like the crackle was deliberate. Yeah. The way that, it, yeah, it was, it was hectic. And that's what's so strange that then eventually Wu Tang's, like Riz's production became so sterile after that. Like after maybe Wu Tang Forever, a lot of the Riz's production just started sounding too sterile because the equipment that he had wasn't that old analog stuff. Yeah. You know, it's, it's. But it's like a lot of those sort of American rappers that the first two albums or the first album's about, I've got nothing, but I'm going to fucking make it. And mm. then when you make it, you're like, well, I've got fucking everything. Yeah. So I guess he's got he's got this sort of um, stuff at his disposal. So mm. it's going to change change the production mm. quality, I guess. Well, it's also like, you know, like he was he was sampling loops off records, possibly using you know a turntable that had a, a worn. Yeah. Stylus, right? So the process that that was going through was just based on the equipment that he was using, but it was already records that had a mastered record yeah, done, right? True. So then when he went through that phase of making everything on keyboards that he was using, he might not have had skills at engineering sounds to make them sound the way that the stuff that was on those records that he sampled sounded. So some of his stuff, you listen to it, and it's like, oh, it's a cheesy keyboard synth. Mm. But it's like, man, if you put it through the right processes, you know, a bit of distortion in certain places, like in certain frequencies and pumped up the bass in certain parts, like it would change the way it sounded. But, and that's what I remember there was an interview he did where he goes, I got 128 tracks and he's talking and it's like anyone with a, anyone with a MIDI sequencer has 128 tracks. Like yeah. it was, it was such a weird thing for him to say. And I remember just going, what? Like, why would you opt for the cheesy sound when you had this great sound? And that's because... You're probably getting hit with sample clearance issues, you know. So then it's really about being able to engineer the sounds. Like recently, I've been making beats just using straight synths and just making everything myself from scratch, and then putting it through processes to make those instruments sound real nice. And it's like I'm happy with the way they sound. But if I was trying to do that 20 years ago, mm. they would have sounded really, really cheesy. Yeah. You know? But and and you're never going to be hit with a fucking sample thing if you're making it mm. all from scratch. Even if you're recreating a sound that you're hearing, I'm saying you're yeah. making it from scratch. It puts it into that sort of grey area yeah. there. Yeah, for sure. So obviously you do a lot of production, and that's your thing. But do you do you think of yourself foremost as a producer or as a rapper? Like, what do you? I think now I probably would would fall more in the producer category. Mm -hmm. um, when I started out, I was definitely more hungry as a rapper. But I'd say now it's probably more production that I focus on because it's it takes the lead with what I'm doing. But I still rap. Mm -hmm. It's just not the only thing I do. So, you know, if I can't write a rhyme, then I'll be working on beats. If I can't do that, I might be doing video, mm -hmm. might be drawing. As long as you're doing something creative. Al always something. And yeah. that's the beauty of all these different elements that, like, if one of them isn't working for you, you just switch up, do something else. And, and then if those aren't working, then I'm trying to learn another skill. Yeah. You know? Yeah, man, that's awesome. One thing I often think about is, so like you've got your beats and you've got them out there, like here's my catalog of beats and you name them. Mm. Now, is that like, how do you name something that's just instrumental when you've got, because have mm. you got a hook in your head potentially or is it just you're like this reminds me of something else? Like how mm. do you name these instrumentals? 
it's funny. I sit back listening to it and I, I think about what it is and then I try and think of words that would describe it and then I try to think of words that I haven't used to describe another beat. And sometimes it'll just be a cool word that I'm mm -hmm. like, yeah, that's sweet. Like, it's interesting because like, you know, say taunts, the 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 names that he puts on his beats, I'm like, what made you think of that? Like, mm. it'll be like my partner got a beat off him recently. It was called Body in the Boot. It's like, like it's a cool s statement, but does the the beat does it make you think of a body in a boot? Yeah, you know what I mean. Like, and someone asked me the same thing, and then it was it was like recently, say I was uploading four beats, then I'd think of a sentence, or I'd think of four uh. words that match. And then I'd name them all something that's part of that sentence. So then when you post it as the hashtags, you read it from the top down mm. and it actually says something. And it's almost know? like a, a, a mini album or an, an EP or yeah. something like that, which I think takes us to another sort of chat where we, we're old heads. We grew up with albums, but mm. music is changing now. And like, mm. is that sort of, I, it won't die in hip hop, but in other music genres, do you reckon the idea of an album is like sustainable? Like are, are people going to, cause kids are just drop, like, just consuming one song here, one song there. Mm. And that sort of thing. Like the body of work thing is kind of, is, is slowly, sadly dying. I don't know, man. I think, I think, I think that's popular music. Mm. And because, because we see that, as uh, because it's the popular thing going on, but all these other genres have become a lot more popular. I think that's just how we perceive it to be. But there's always going to be good albums getting mm -hmm. dropped because there are going to be artists who are artist artists who look at it from that perspective. They want to make a body of work, whereas there are others who are like, I just got to drop a single for the gram, mm. you know. And I think that's the distinction. Like, like even with hip hop, it's become so popular now that it's mainstream, but then there's always going to be underground artists who just want to drop dope underground albums to pay homage to the fact that that's what they grew up on. So That's it. And you, yeah. you, you strike me as the kind of person that is happy in the underground, do you know what I mean? Hundreds, that's yeah. where, where you want to be. Yeah. But I, I, I guess there's got to be people that are in the scene that I feel like they're trapped in the underground, like they fucking, they're a bit dirty on the fact that they never fucking made it do you know what i mean yeah. but you strike me as someone who's like this is where i am this is where i belong and i'm I'm comfortable in this zone I, i've got the skill set to be a pop star if i wanted to be uh, yeah and that, I, I'm, yeah. it's not my thing not you don't yeah. want to do it yeah i like i like like i love the underground and the aspect of it that you got to dig to find good mm -hmm. stuff and i think that obscurity has merit like i think that it actually is a really important aspect of it because to to me that's where the passion came from yeah. like there are a lot of fly by nighters that just oh i want to have a hit and they might have a hit song and then next song they have they don't get anything oh no love oh I, i'm gonna quit and it's it's the same as anything like would mm -hmm. you would you stop doing the art because the people that you perceive as being the ones who are interested in your art don't like it like mm. would, would beethoven have stopped making music because people you know th there's a meme it's like bait that, that no, uh, people thought beethoven shouldn't make music did he listen <laughs> you know he had no ears so yeah. it's, but it's like he would have still made music yeah. regardless because that was part but of his function you don't know? you feel like those people are in it for the wrong reasons to start 100%. with that's the thing like people say to me with this podcast like i'm l not making money but i'm also it cost me money to do it and mm. people are like so what's the goal i'm like well do you ask someone mm. why they fucking paint a picture 100%. do you know what i mean i'm like i'm doing it because it's what i want to yeah, do and it. if if and when you make some money well good on you yeah what, all these dudes out there that are painting graffiti still, they're not not only are they not making any money out of it, mm. they're also risking their safety and their fucking whatever yeah. to go and paint something. Yeah. And no one's going up to them saying, well, when are you going to make some money out of this? That's, a, that's what I mean is that there's no you, – you can't really put a monetary value on a, a therapeutic art form. And it's, that's what I mean. Like it's you can you can make music – to be popular and make money. And I could certainly do that if that's what I wanted to do, but my heart doesn't feel it. Like if I was into pop music, I'd make it. Yeah. But if I tried to just make pop music tomorrow, couldn't do it. I don't listen to pop music. It's not in yeah. my heart. So it's music is more of an expression of your soul and same with anything. So if you're doing something that you enjoy doing, then how, how can you beat that? Like if you get paid for it, super bonus. Mm -hmm. But if your only motivation is to get paid 
and you're trying to do what's popular, well, it might work for you, but eventually you're going to end up hating what you do. Yeah, and then it just becomes a normal job. Yeah. So was there ever a point where you thought maybe under an alias I could make some pop tracks and sell them to someone else, that sort of thing? Yeah, I've, th- I've thought of it. Like, I mean, my dad would always look at me and be like, why are you, why are you making hip-hop music? Like, you should you should do – and my brother would say the same, and I'd be like – I mean, like, I, like I'd try and explain. Mm. Like, I, like, I've got the skill set to be able to do that. If a pop artist hit me up and was like, oh, I need a beat, would you make me a song? And I want it to you know, be like, yeah, come to the studio, let's work on a song. I can engineer that for you. I couldn't write the lyrics because mm. I don't listen to pop songs. Like, yeah. So, I mean, you know, I, I could make some genre of music trying to do it, but it probably wouldn't work for me because my, my heart's not there. And you'd you know? feel like it's not authentic, you know what I mean? 100%. Like, yeah. I'd, I'd rather do, like, I'd rather do those videos that people do on TikTok or Instagram where they f- take some funny, you know, interview that someone's done or some something funny Songify. and turn it into yeah, yeah, a song. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I find that stuff amusing and I'm like, that'd be hilarious, you know? Yeah. But trying to just make pop music for the sake of it or some other genre, I feel like the... I mean, it could work. Mm. It's just not me. But like, it doesn't, and you, and it wouldn't sit right with you. You're like, I'm making this, like you're sort of, even if it's under an alias, you're still selling out to an extent, and it just, you don't feel like it's artistically what you want to do. If it blew up and gave me a million bucks that allowed me to do all the stuff that I want to do, I, I would see the merit. Mm-hmm. But then spending time doing it, I, I just, it's, I, I. I'd have to be smashed mm. in order to do it. You yeah. know what I mean? It'd be like, oh, let's make a techno song for the sake of it. And mm. it's like, it'd be fun doing it. But if it's not something that I genuinely get a buzz out of, I may as well be doing something else. And then you're you going to cop everybody going, why don't you do this hit again? And you're like, man, because I did it and I'm fucking over it. I just want to keep doing this yeah. stuff. So, yeah. And you just embrace the underground. And I guess with anything, you find your core audience and it may not be the best, but they're fucking loyal. You know what I mean? Like, and they and they stick with mm. it. Like the Aussie hip hop, like dudes that collect wax and all the t shirts and everything. Like, it's not a huge market, mm. but they're they're fucking they get behind everybody. Yeah. It's like the metal market. It's mm. the same. It's the same vibe, and that's the thing. The the real nature of it and the authenticity is what makes it what it is, and that's why people appreciate it. So if you're trying to be something that you're not that you lose that core market. Mm. And it's like, it, like I, I never even, like I still spin out that I even have a market. I still spin out that people hit me up and go, oh man, I've been listening to your tunes. For, I'm just like, what? I can't believe anyone ever listened to any of them. Mm. You know, so it still bugs me out that it's even a thing. Mm. But everyone in, in this, so this is a thing. Let me just word this correctly. The love that people show is is great but when it comes from somebody that you respect it's worth a lot more mm. so even for doing this for me i'd rather have a thousand views but people dm me that i respect and mm. say keep doing it man i like that than have fucking mm. you know hundreds of thousands of views because that's yeah. why you do it yeah and i think the aussie hip-hop community is very much like that if you're getting your contemporaries your peers people that you respect and look up to yeah. say hey man i copped your last album i really dig it that's why you do it that's the currency of hip-hop that's it and, and that's and it and when you get that respect yeah, yeah. but i think trying to explain that to people that are outside that sort of they just don't can't really comprehend it they don't it get seems it. to be yeah. older people like, you know, I've got another business. People are like, well, why are you throwing money away at this thing? I'm like, because it's what I want to do. Yeah. Like, just some people, I guess, and then generally people that aren't artistic mm. can't understand why you would do anything that doesn't have a monetary reward yeah, at the yeah, end. They it. can't comprehend it. Yeah, but that, then they get to a point where their their soul yearns for something more. It's called a midlife crisis or something. and they, That's exactly it. And they yeah. think that if they buy this car or they do that, then it's going to change it the way they feel. And it's like if you're not feeding your soul regularly, yep. then what's the point of having it? Yeah. You know? And that's and I think like obviously people come to you and they say, look, I want to make a record. I, you know, even if it's not a body of work, they just want to do this because it's something they've always mm-hmm. wanted to do. And you, you obviously – you can pick and choose who you who you work with, but you must get some people that come to you and then you see that that sort of feeds their, like you said, feed their soul. Like that sort of helps them through a part of their life that they might have been really struggling with. Bro, it's, it's like I say quite often that I've seen music save some people's lives and I've seen it ruin some mm. people's lives. And it ruins the lives of the people who are chasing that popular 
vibe and it saves the lives of people who realize the therapeutic value in it mm -hmm. you know like my boy just finished his album and he's so stoked like mental as he just dropped he, he's about to drop it on the 27th called the truth out and he's so stoked mm -hmm. that he finally got a cd out like he was planning on doing a cd years ago trying to put this album together and he just went through the ringer and he didn't end up getting it done so then probably spent a couple of years feeling like he, he was failing because he didn't get what he wanted to do done and now he's getting it done and when you actually see someone set a goal mm. and achieve it and then they're like man that's the first time i've actually sat there and fully gone i'm going to do this for ages and put something together and then put it out into the world and then people are watching and they're paying attention and they're going man that's really cool like you said mm. the currency of respect when people are paying respect to him for what he's done it's like that you can't you can't no, beat that man. no it's it really can't that's it and and as as someone who's helping facilitate that it must be extremely rewarding for you to be like man i and you know as someone who's an artist yourself you know the mm, process that this yeah. guy's this person is going through yeah and then to see them get the get that final product for you know, sure, it must be man. fucking rewarding it's a it's a super it's a real big blessing and and through my journey i've encountered people who were trying to make music because they thought, oh, if I try and make this genre of music, that then I'll blend hip hop with this and I'll do that, then I'll get more gigs and this and that. And then where are they now? Like, mm. They're not still doing it. Because they've jumped like, on another trend. They, that's it. Yeah. And, they, and they're the ones that got bitter because, oh, I, I didn't get... I didn't get famous. And it's like, it, it's, not a, it's not about the fame. Like, it's about the work. It's about doing it. Mm. And it's like some... I think... I remember Bunk saying to me once when when... I can't remember if it was one of my albums or his album, and he said something about now you're immortal because the, the songs are out there in the ether forever. Yeah. And it's like even, like I think Greville Records in Paran, I think they actually, um, they supply the National Archives with a copy of every CD that they've wow. ever sold. Yeah. So they... Like Acme type of... They, yeah, they archive yeah. it all. Yeah. So like most of the BTE catalogue up until probably about 2015, 2016 would have ended up in the National Archives. It's immortal. So it's immortal. Yeah. You know, and when he said that to me, I, it just blew my mind because I didn't really... You don't really think about it when you're doing something. You just do it. And then when you look back, you go... Wow, we really did that, mm. you know? Do you find some artists that you work with, they are not fucking down that they didn't, it didn't do what they wanted it to, but then they come back like, man, I'm not getting the fucking, the traction that I wanted. And you just say to them, look, that's the game, man. Like, you know, you, there's a lot of stuff out there. Mm. I think it's even worse in this social media realm because it's more um, visible. Yeah. So they think about it more. And I, I'll always say the same thing. I'll be like, are you doing it for the people, for the likes, or are you doing it because, mm. like, that for you? And that's that's what I mean. I always bring it back to, like, this is therapy. Like, And I say to a lot of the people who come to the studio as well or I've worked with, I'm like, you could, you could go to a shrink, you can pay... 200 bucks an hour, tell a guy your problems, and he'll go, oh, here you go, take this pill, whatever, I'll see you next week, you know? And it doesn't really change anything for you, but you can come and achieve something by making something, get it off your chest, listen back to it, play it to other people that are then going, man, it's like you, it's like you said what I've been feeling and thinking, but I didn't know how to put it into words. And I've, I had one client who would come into the studio on NDIS payments. Wow. You know, and he was, he's actually coming in and he was bipolar and he had, you know, he everything was chaotic until he got into the studio and then he was just quiet after recording. And it was like a totally different person because he'd get it all out. And it, eventually the NDIS didn't see the merit in it because I wasn't, registered as a um music therapist oh, that's fucked man and you know my, yeah. my i haven't seen that guy for a while because he, he ended up having a bit of a meltdown because they stopped that one mm. form of therapy and he'd be calling me going man like this is the only thing yeah. that's working for me yeah and i'd be writing letters to them going like listen to these lyrics of what he's saying here and what he's saying that he's tell me that's not therapy yeah. yeah he's talking about how he feels where he went wrong how he needs to fix it and what he's going through. And I, and I bet that you as his, as his psychologist haven't even heard him say that mm. because it's probably his deepest, darkest fear to tell you what he thinks and be dismissed for, for the way he feels. But he can put it on a song 
and get it out there. And he might he might never play it to people, but he plays it to himself. He'll play it to the person that he hurt or mm. something like that. You know, yeah. it's, and it was it was really sad to see how that went down because it was like I could see the merit in it, and then to know that he was just treated like a number. And they couldn't see the merit in it. And yeah. for me, music really is therapeutic. Like it's, you know, you might go through a breakup, write a song. You know, sometimes the the problem that you have is because all you're doing is writing songs. Mm. So you're like, oh, I don't, I need a job. Oh, my my, and my answer to that was, I'll oh, just keep writing songs. Yeah. You know? Well, you fin- if you keep doing what you love, I feel like anyone's going to figure out a way. The money will come eventually. And I think people that are in that mindset. Mm. They don't want a lot of money. You just want enough money to keep doing what you like. Yeah. So that's it. So yeah. no, no one wants zillions of dollars. Well, I don't. I don't want. I just want enough money to keep doing what I'm doing. Yeah. So you keep writing songs, and then you've eventually figured out a way besides the revenue that the label generates you, but the studio mm. stuff and all that is another way that you can monetize things. That's pretty much my only monetary. What, what, yeah. Monetary income is from studio stuff and production. The label, since since the physical. Since physical distribution ended, it's just me selling the stock that I still have mm. through the website in dribs and drabs. So yeah. all the artists are doing their own digital stuff and the digital realm is not a huge payout for anyone. Mm. So my skill set as a producer and a sound engineer is my prime income, but I still have a second job mm. still doing AV builds. Yep. Big up Brattles. Mm-hmm. My boy put me on, gave me a job yep. helping set up doing like sound systems for raves and whatnot you know through like one month ago or just less than a month ago i was i was standing behind the desk at a at a hectic rave at a pavilion show yeah. you know what i mean just making sure that the the speakers weren't blowing and that everything was running all right and i was i was working there so it's even though i have a skill set that i is my primary function i still have another job to make sure Mm. that I can pay my rent. Yeah, and know? I think in the whole in that whole scene that's the case for everybody. You're one of the more successful people, mm. you know, there's people that have been grinding away for years that you know just put these CDs out just give them away and yeah. shit. Like it's a I, I think like I said before though, the hip hop Aussie hip hop community is good where they will buy your merch, they'll buy your, you know, but you can't survive off mm. that. Yeah, and now that you've got the studio, I guess it takes you. You you know a lot of people in the scene, so you work with them, and then I guess it becomes a bit not awkward, but you've got to ask them. You've got to be like, "Yeah, man, you're my mate. I'll fucking hook you up." But mm. you still got to pay for all this. Oh, you man, know what I mean? That's it's got. I, like I went through all that for years. I I torture myself on it. Like, have, have I got enough of a skill set to be able to charge for it? And then it became a thing where you realize time is the only currency that's really of any value. And then when you're giving your time away then you need to be compensated for your time if you're going to invest it in somebody else's project and most artists they they're aware because they realize that it's it's a goal-driven thing they and i'll be real with everyone when they come in i'm I'm like man like don't expect to be a millionaire from making local hip-hop it might blow but it might not and that's why i always say to them this is more a therapeutic thing like if you look at it from that perspective like i said you can you can go to the shrink and you can pay that money Mm. Or you can go to the studio and make an album, and that for, for, it will forever be a note to self that you can reflect upon. And if you put it out in the world, then you might see rewards in other ways than financial, or you might see financial rewards for it. But if it's your primary focus, well, then, when you look you know, at who from the sort of Melbourne hip hop scene that really has made a sustainable long jet, like there's only a handful of people yeah. that you could think of, yeah. you know. That's it. And so I think some of these people were probably a little bit delusional. to, th- And those dudes would probably have a lot of major label backings, which then gets them fucking radio play, which mm-hmm. then gets them tours. So there, it is, it's, you've got to fucking like get struck by lightning type scenario. Man, that's, I mean, people have asked me, do you think I'll make it? And and I'm what's like, making make, it? Make, make what? <laughs> yeah. Like, what is it that you, what is it that you want to achieve? And if they're like, oh, I want to be famous, it's like, well, do you do you really want to open that door? Mm. Do you want to like because once once you become like an asset to the major label industry, then is it really your art anymore? Are you directing what art you make, or is it? Are you in a position where you can go? This is the music I make, and they'll just put it out, yeah. 
and you get a paycheck? Or is it going to be you're talking to A&Rs and that that are like, oh, you need to make songs like this. This is what's popping right now. Mm. Oh, you need to do a, a track on one of those style beats. And it's like, well, that's not really what I came for. And that's yeah. that's the thing. I've always been sort of on the side of the industry. And it's funny because there are people in the industry that see what I'm doing, see what my crew are doing, see what, you know, and they they take inspiration off things we do and they run with it, but then they they don't mess with us, mm. you know. But they look and they're like, oh, well, this guy's sustaining himself, maintaining. But it's like if I didn't have another skill set other than rapping, yeah, I'd, I'd be working a dead end job doing something else. Like, yeah, you know? I think in like the mid two thousands, like Oz Melbourne hip hop and Oz hip hop, and with like obese and everything, was mm -hmm. like it was really out there. Yeah, it was getting a lot of radio play and that sort of thing. Triple J was all like was playing all sorts of fucking hundred percent. Like yeah. man, you know, like. Dudes that wouldn't wouldn't get radio play two years before are yep. getting like a Triple J fucking feature album, you know, Bro. like the Funkors and like Downside, all yep. those sort of dudes. It was popping. It was everywhere, yep. and then people are like, I guess, and they're more so the people who think we're going to make it because they think that's sort of making mm -hmm. it, you know. Yeah. And then like more recently, I think Curse has been popular, and he's like, I did it without any Triple J play. Yep. Then he tries, they play him now, and he's like, fuck you. Yeah, like, yeah. you weren't there from the start. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. And do, do you agree with him on that sort of thing? Well, I mean, that's, I love it. I, I'd like big up mm. to him for his journey because it's, and that's the thing. He, he encountered that adversity by making the songs that he did in an era when the radio wasn't trying to play it. Like, there was radio shows that Dead Set wouldn't play anything that didn't have a female artist doing the chorus. Like, I remember Nova had a strict rule. They wouldn't really? play- They wouldn't they play- They told that to- They really? wouldn't play hip hop if it didn't have a female singing the chorus, right? Mm. They wouldn't play- Because it was too aggressive. It just wasn't on brand for That's them or That's it. And I mean, yeah. now you got the radio playing songs about <clears throat> stabbing each other. Yeah. But they, they wouldn't play any street rap yeah. five, six years ago. So what's changed? And it's like Cursor was always consistent making the music that he made and Triple J never gave him a bar. Mm. But he's but he's maintained and still done it. He's got a good team of management with him and he was consistent with his with his craft and his fan base loved him for it's it. It's so the fan base. It's building the fan base, isn't it? Once you get that fan base behind you, then you, the labels, the radio play is it's insignificant. That's it. The, I mean, the, the street brand fan base like the grassroots movement is that's that's where it all comes from mm. you know and, and like when like i think he's probably one of the only independent artists that actually is selling units in jb hi-fi mm. like because you can't get you can't like when when obese records closed down for distribution there's no other distributors that picked it up right so all the all the art like bte hasn't had distribution that I think I hit up one guy about distro and he'd hit me up going, oh, yeah, I can get 10 CDs. In a, I was like, 10, what's the point? Mm. You know, we were moving thousands of CDs yeah. in, nationwide. So Curse is probably the only independent artist in Australia that I can think of that has, I, I, I don't know what sort of deal he's got, but I assume he might have a, a distribution deal with Warner or I, I don't know, but he, I assume that he's probably got a distributor somewhere along the way that's getting it into JB Hi-Fi, and he's selling more units than anyone else. Well, people are consuming them. I don't know. They're yeah. probably pinching them a bit as well. <laughs> oh, I mean, that. well, that's the thing. If, if your CD gets pinched at JB Hi-Fi, then they won't restock it. Right. So you don't – ah, oh, okay. You know, like at one point, Taunts is um, – I think it was Decimation Recordings. I think that was like the most stolen Aussie hip hop CD at like about 10 different. Which is a cool fucking title to have. It was cool, but because of that, those particular stores wouldn't reorder it. Yeah. And the reason why is because it would be in their system as them having it. Yeah. It's the, but it wasn't stock on the takes shelf. Yeah. So when you'd hit them up and go, oh, will you, will you take more stock? They go, no, we've still got 11. Oh. Oh, yeah. And it's like, no, but there's none on the shelves. It's like, well, it still says we had 11, so if they got stolen, we're not going to buy them. But they still paid the artist for those? They they did, did. at the time. That yeah. was the thing. It was on firm sales. And then once it got to a point where that they go, oh, well, we might send stock back if we don't sell it all, and then the distributor would have to maintain a percentage of the funds that were coming from the stock in case there were return items from yeah. you know because it all changed like originally there was one guy who was helping do the distribution into jb hi-fi and he was a fan 
And then, like, we could call up the stores and go, oh, this artist has a new album out. Last last time they put an album out, you guys sold 50 units through that store. Do you want to take 50 units? And they'll be like, yeah. But then it got to a point where JB Hi-Fi said, you got to go direct through head office. Mm -hmm. And then head office will make that decision. So the store that you sold 50 units in last time is now like, oh, we'll take two. Yeah, and all you that know? all that building rapport with the store is all gone. All gone, Yeah, you know. So it's a, it was a different beast. And then once the distribution ended, no one really has distribution. And that's the thing. If, if there was distribution for physical product, people wouldn't be relying on streams as much. Mm. They wouldn't be trying to do what they're doing on the streams. They'd be getting it into the stores. But then a lot of the independent stores don't have the outlay to be able to go, I'm going to buy 50 units up front or mm. guaranteed you sales. You get consignment sort of, yeah. You get consignment and then consignment becomes a bit of a headache as well. So it's without the powerhouse behind you to guarantee those firm sales, it yeah. dies off, you know? And, and so that's then, why it's amazing when an artist like Cursor can get those sales in JB Hi-Fi. And then turn so around and stick up. his finger up and say, I didn't need you guys. In this hundred, you yeah. know, that's what I mean. It's like power to him. Like. But there's never been a better time, I guess, from an artist's perspective because you can do everything, by, not by yourself, but you can do it independently if you choose to. And you if can. your stuff's good enough, it should get seen by the right people. Yeah, for sure. Not like the old days where you would have to go and just play gigs so someone might see you so that they could introduce you to this way. If your stuff's good enough... Any kid could put something out and it could blow up on YouTube yeah. or something. Yeah, for so sure. So it's a good time to be an artist in that respect. For sure. But, the, I mean, with that being said, you're still battling algorithms, right? So it's it's now a, a different thing. So you have to have, like, say, you have to know someone who's good at SEO, like yeah. search engine optimization and stuff like that makes a big difference. Like, I don't know any of that stuff. I'm no. not good at it. No. So, I, you know, like one of my songs plays and then someone else's song will play straight after that on mm. on YouTube or whatever, unless you have someone who's actually doing all that back-end work to make sure that people find your music because yeah. it's a different beast now. I think on, like, Spotify, you've got to get the ads on those playlists because once you get on there and then people are like, yeah. well, this song had millions of views, you're like, because people are clicking that playlist and it's playing through yeah, and then it. someone else goes, oh, I like that song, I'll add it to my personal one. Yeah. And that would bump you up again because you're getting, yeah. yeah. So and it's playing the game still. It is. And um, I mean, and you can go Google like, oh, how do I get added to playlists and how do I get my music seen? And it's always the same playbook, which is, oh, spam everyone, basically. Yeah, but. Send DMs to everyone. Tag every artist that you know in your music. And it's like me as an artist, I'm like, man, if someone's tagging me in their stuff, then it's got nothing to do with me. I just don't pay I'm like, dude. I've got a million things to do. Like, I don't have time to be checking everything that everyone's tagging me in. Or if you send me a DM with your link and I don't understand what's... I'm like, why are you sending me... Like, why is this person... But I don't you know, know what? They never write back those people when you ignore them. Yeah. Because you know why? Because I send it to everyone. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, they just, they're just throwing it That's out. That's what I shit. mean. And it's... it's um, oh, What's the word? Like, it's... Oh, there's, a, there's a million words I could use for it, but it's just... it's. It's just disingenuous. Yeah, that's the word that I'm looking for. It's just as it lacks, it lacks any sort of oomph. You know, yeah, it's, to uh, me, it's just fake. It's the it's, like, it's the lowest common denominator kind of yeah. promotion sort of thing. Yeah, like if I like, like it, if you if you just upload your song and I manage to see it, I will like it. I'll share it if I like it. But yep. if you're just spamming it to me and I don't know who you are, I'm like. Yeah, and it's disrespectful as well. Like, it's like you shouldn't just do that to people you don't know. That's, you know? The, like, that's you the could, generation we're in, though. People I know, but don't you should realize, reach out and it? say, hey, I like what you do, mm. and I really, I look up to you. Here's my new song. Yeah, yeah. Right? Not just like link me, and they think you're going to click it, and you're going to go, yeah. amazing. Yeah, I, I often get messages that are like that. And if it's a, if it's a, polite message from someone going, oh, I'm working on tracks or this and that, and I've got the time to do it, I'll check out what they're doing. Mm. But if it's just a, if it's just a link going, yo, I got got a new song, check my... It's like, I don't even know who this person is. It's in my hidden requests. Yeah. We're not even friends. Yeah. Who, does he follow? Oh, they don't follow me. They don't even follow you yeah, to do that. They just that's send fucked. it every, to everything. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's, and, it's, and, and that's what I mean. They've gone and Googled 
how do I get my music played? And they've they follow the playbook, and it's to me, it's like, oh man, like this is just blatant. Like, yeah, it's I think too much. there's so much content out there on, especially on social media and on YouTube, mm. about how to make more content. Yeah, you're like, this is kind of getting a bit fucking ridiculous. When I started doing this, I'm like, how do you set up a podcast? I start looking at stuff. I realize there's people that make these videos just about how they make videos. Yeah, and it's like huge. It's like getting a bit too like. I don't know, man. There's an unboxing video for everything. It's like, do we need all that shit out oh, there? I saw a thing the other day, and it was somewhat, it, and it was like, oh, how to get your, how to get your, how to make your video go viral, but the guy had ten views. Yeah. So, so he's, how he's not does what, is, what, he yeah, what does he know about <laughs> yeah. you know? And you see it, and it's like, man, this is just hilarious. Like, and everyone wants to go viral. It's like, why? Okay. Yeah, I think people get addicted to that stuff, though. So I think it happens a lot. I see people that I know, and this happens a lot on TikTok because anyone can go viral with the algorithm. You don't mm. need a lot of followers. Yeah. And I see people will do something, and it might get a million views out of nowhere, and mm. they're just a normal person, yeah. and they chase that fucking dragon like it's a drug. Mm. They just keep trying to yeah. recreate it and get that other million fucking views, yeah. which equates to nothing yeah. except social clout. Like, what does it even mean? Yeah, unless it's monetized to point that it's worth that time and effort and it's like i get it if you if you're making good coin from making viral content cool i, I get it but if there's if there's nothing genuine about the virality of it if it doesn't go viral because it's interesting if it's just because you followed this playbook on art oh, you know on making clickbait like that's the worst like people have this clickbait and everyone looks at it and before you know it they're getting a million clicks on that and they see the ad and then you get your youtube monetization it's like it's it's uh, again disingenuous. Yeah, you know? totally. Um, with let, let's talk about Melbourne again for a bit because we did. Yeah, yeah, it's been natural. Sure. <laughs> my, my notes are gone off the, out the window because I've just we've just been jumping around. But then you moved to Melbourne. Yep. And where did you land? And who showed you the ropes? And what did you first fucking do when you got here? And we're talking. This is sort of mid nineties now. No, nah, 2000. 2000. I moved here in 2000. Okay. Yep. So I've been here 23 years. I came here with my boy. Par one, who was the guy that I mentioned before mm -hmm. that I I learnt to fight in 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 case I had to fight him, <laughs> but we ended up moving here together. It's a good metaphor for martial arts because you've learned to fight because you thought you had to fight him, and then in the end you become friends, which is whole the whole martial arts thing. That's it. Yeah, yeah. similar interests cool. and yeah. all that, you know. So we um we moved here together, and at first we stayed out in Williamstown at a friend of his house, and um waited till we got an apartment then we ended up getting a spot in st kilda just yeah. off the beach there yeah nice and that was cool so then i started school at rmit and i got a job at nando's yeah right memory. that's where i was working the st kilda nando's the st kilda nando's yeah, I used to yeah. Go in there, yeah yeah i might have made your chicken you might have made yeah. the chicken burger yeah, yeah. um from memory, that was right next to the lane, and the lane used to get painted a lot. Yeah, yeah. So like Mick and stuff from episode four, they painted that like that spot yeah, there a bunch of times. I definitely saw that, their pieces yeah. in there, and that was part of the magic of me moving here and seeing a lot of like graph everywhere. You go down that lane, man, and there'd be fucking syringes everywhere yeah, and pretty dingers hectic. and shit. Yeah. And until they cleaned up that bit of coals, that was a, a pretty hectic laneway. Yeah, the things that I saw yeah. living in Saint Kilda. <laughs> And I, I trained in St. Kilda as well. So I was walking along um, Carlisle Street to get back to my house after training. The PCYC? Um, no, we were oh. training just above a bakery in Balaclava. Okay. So I'd train at the bake or the spot above the bakery and then walk home or ride home. And man, you'd see everything like passing all the, you know, all the hookers on the corners, yeah. all the Johns going to. I'd, I'll never forget like seeing this real weird dude. Real weird dude walking off all scurrying all weird. And, and then in the darkness, just from where he scurried, I just saw like a cigarette being like smoked. And I just heard this like real raspy female voice going, that's not on, a. Eh? That's really fucked, eh? <laughs> like that. And I felt like asking, like, what did he ask you? Yeah. You know? So I saw so many weird things in St. Kilda. I lived there for probably the last 20 years, man, at yeah. like Balaclava, East St. Kilda. Yeah. Um, and like Jackson Street behind mm -hmm. behind uh, 
fucking Fitzroy Street. So, yeah, there's definitely, you'd see some shit. It was a big culture shock, man. Coming from Canberra and then moving here, I was like, whoa. And back in 2000, sorry to cut you off, Mm -hmm. back in the 2000s, St Kilda was really like a party place. Like, it's it's changed now, but, you know, you had, the ESPY was still the old ESPY. That's it, You know, you had the, where a lot of gigs happened um, next to Luda Park there at the Palais. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, I saw Wu-Tang there, yep. like, in the early 2000s. And then you had the Prince of Wales was still going off. There was – it was, like – it was really fucking – stuff was happening yeah, there. It was like, people were partying. Sure. There was a lot of shit going on. Yeah. Which is not like that anymore. No, nah, it's definitely changed a lot since then. It was – I mean, it was great. It was a, it was a great – it was a great place to be introduced to Melbourne living in, you know. And a lot of people are that come from interstate. That's where they sort of yeah, land. for sure. And then they figure out where they're going to go after yeah. partying. And Everyone for- wants to live a bit near the beach and then you realise it's not really a beachy beach, mm. you know. It's a cool spot. It's cool to have barbecues at and hang out. And then the nightlife was cool, but it's expensive to live at. And then, I mean, man, I, I, was, I think I've moved about 20 times since living here. Yeah. In 23 really? years. So I've moved, I've lived so many different suburbs and all, all over the place, over that side of the river, over over the west side now. I've just, I've moved so many times since yeah. being here. Yeah. And where do you, where do you like think that the permanent spot is like, where do you want to be moving forward? I don't know, man. I mean, I like where I'm staying now. I, I like it out west. It's cool. It's funny because I used to live three minutes away from where I live now. But I didn't have a car at the time, and the area wasn't as developed, and I hated it. Mm. You know, I couldn't because it took me like twenty-five minutes to walk from the tram stop to my house. I just hated it. It took forever to get the tram there, and it just felt like it was so far away. But with a car, it's so close to everything. Mm. You know, and it's funny because I I often go past my old house, and I'm like, man, it's so tripping. Like I, I live right here. And and this whole suburban area wasn't there when I lived there. It's tripping. You yeah, know? but so you like it out west? Yeah, I do. I I think it's really cool. It's a it's a great spot. Yeah, I, I mean I I've liked pretty much all the spots that I've lived in, like as houses they're all cool. But I think just out west is kind of cool. Like having a car makes it a lot easier because yeah. I can get everywhere quicker. You know, this day. Like these days, man, everything's so spread out. You need mm. a like, it's cool to get around on public transport. Mm. If you don't have a car, getting around, man, it's fucked. There's a bit, it's a big city now, mm. man. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's a lot of fucking places that aren't aren't going to be that convenient yeah. to get to. Oh, for sure, man. <laughs> uh, what about like so? When you first came here, you're living in St Kilda. You start to do. You, okay, so you're still producing. You're doing everything, but people don't know who you are really at this point, or they yeah. do to an extent. Do you have to still? No you, one knew me. No, no one knew. So you've got to go out find like-minded people. Yeah. I guess you go into sort of Chapel Street. You, you stick your head into Obese and see what's happening there. Is that yeah. the, kind of what you? Is that, that was, the plan of attack. Yeah, my mate, New Sense, who I'd only met a few times prior to that, told me when you move to Melbourne, you've got to go to Obese Records. Mm. Which you would be familiar with already. Yeah. Yeah. So I went there and that's where I met Bias B and I was like, I bought a CD off you like seven years ago in Sydney when you were on tour. We were chatting and then because I was studying, I actually, um, like I was studying sound engineering and one of the one of the things in the course was to get a job for work experience somewhere within the music industry so instead of trying to get a job at a studio which mm-hmm. everyone was doing i thought i'd get a job at a record store so i asked shazlik who was running obese at the time if he'd let me do work experience there so i did like two weeks of work experience there with brad strutt and bias b and shaz and that yeah. was magic you know i met heaps more people that way and then so that was kind of where i, I met a few more heads but i was going to shows and trying to meet people, but I wasn't really very outgoing because mm-hmm. it's different trying to trying to make new friends when you're an adult. Yeah, you know, and it's in a whole new place. You don't it's daunting know who, coming from some such a small it spot. Really was, and other people that I know who moved here couldn't handle it, and mm. ended up going, "Okay, I've got to go." I've got to go back home. Too much going on. Yeah. And, and you might meet some people that don't, you're like, oh, you know, this guy's like, I don't know that guy because that other side of Melbourne's a totally different yeah. world. Yeah. And people were guarded. I remember talking to someone about it and this chick said, oh, it's on you. You've got to you've got to call those people that you're meeting. They're not going to call you until you come hang out with us. Because they're meeting new people all the time and stuff. That's yeah. it. It's like you got to develop those friendships. And I was like, oh, all right. So I'd go out to gigs and meet people. And then I remember going to a gig at the lounge. I think J-Red was playing. It was one of the Madisms gigs from memory at the mm-hmm. lounge back when that was on. I'm not sure if it was Madism at the lounge. I know he did them at the laundry. 
but it might have been at the lounge too. Can't remember what the name of those gigs were, but J Red was definitely on the decks. And that's where I saw Bigfoot and Taunts rapping on the mic and they had an open mic. So I got up and did that. And then they were like, oh yeah, they liked what I was kicking. So they said hello and I met them. And then just over time I met other, that, that's why it was funny that you had Jumble on because there was a, there was like a big like train that got painted by a bunch of dudes. Mm -hmm. And I heard about that at the lounge and I was like, I've got to go find this place. Mm -hmm. I've got to see this with my own eyes. So I went out to Ringwood to see this and I found it. And at the train station, Bunks and the, the dude who wrote Bicep came up and approached me because I looked so different. Yeah. Wearing like Nike tracksuit and a polo. So they're like, oh, yeah, have you seen it yet? And I go, take me to it, you know? So we walked and I think they thought I was a D. I think they thought I was, I don't know. So you, this is your first meeting with Bunks? First Bunks meeting, yeah. Yeah, that's a fucking cool story, yeah. though. Yeah. Oh, it was classic. And then I was telling them, oh, yeah, I'm from Canberra. I moved here to study. I, I rap. And they're like, oh, you rap, do you? Okay. And one of them kicked the beatbox. And then Bicep, I think Bicep kicked the beatbox or maybe Bunks did. I can't remember who did what, but one of them rapped and one of them beatbox. So then I rapped and then they, they knew I was official. They were like, okay, this guy actually can rap. So then we hung out and we checked the panel out. And then from there, I met some more of the HG dudes, you know, and that's that before we were all HG. Mm. So that was kind of where I started meeting people after, but it was, I wasn't really that outgoing, but I managed to encounter them that day and then going to the lounge and to the open mic nights, I met a mm. few people. So over time, develop some friendships. Yeah, know? so Laundry was definitely on that sort of scene as well, in that sort of scene as well. Yeah. And Revolver was doing stuff too. Revolver was doing the MC battles, and I guess that was that was probably where I became more well-known because mm -hmm. I battled Bias B, you know, at the, at the Revolver battle. And I think I always laugh about it because I think people didn't know who I was, but they remembered me because when I was battling him, I rhymed Bias B with Hepatitis C. <laughs> Can't remember all the lyrics. But you knew him by this stage because you work, did the work experience yeah, and already. So they didn't know that you're just some work that, experience nah, kid. And, that, and that's why it was so freaky to me because, like, he was the first Oz Hip Hop CD I'd ever bought because the only other artist that I'd really <laughs> met in the hip hop world that rapped was Coolism in Canada. Yeah, was that? Yeah, the house from there. Yeah. That's it. And, like, so I'd met Bias and bought his CD. And then when I moved to Melbourne, and I entered into the battle, the first person I had to battle, like, was Bias. Yeah. So he, and he slayed me, you know? <laughs> he, he should be like the end of the, the boss at the yeah, end the of the end video boss. game. Yeah, yeah, he it. And, and he won and, it that and, year, you and know? You, and you had him first round. Yeah. <laughs> and he, he beat me. Welcome to Melbourne, like, oh. man. Yeah. That was it. So three years running, I was in that MC battle, and then eventually I, I won that. And I, so I got, I developed my, my um, career path over mm -hmm. time. Yeah. But yeah, it, was, it took a while, man. It took about probably three or four years before people started knowing who I was and, you know, meeting people properly and hanging out and getting to know each other, you know. Because yeah. so you're dealing with people that have lived in Melbourne, that have lived here with their crew the whole time, you know what I mean? That's it. And there's a lot of people that come here from other states because if you're going to do something artistic, really, you could go to Sydney or Melbourne. There's yeah. not a lot in the other major cities. Yeah, so you're it. coming in here with people that have already got these fucking established friendships. And, that's it. Yeah. And in the hip-hop world, people are pretty guarded, you know, so they're like, who's this out-of-towner, mm. you know? So it took a while. So you let, you let your, your, your craft speak for itself. Yeah. But like you said, it didn't, it didn't happen straight away. It took you three years or something. It took me three years to get to that point where people recognised me and knew my name. But that, you know? and see, so, but you're in this hip-hop scene you're valuable to people because you can produce as well. Yeah. Because everyone, there's a lot more rappers out there than there are producers. Yeah. So I, I guess that's going to help you help your cause with with finding find you know people in that sort of scene as well. Yeah, for sure. When I when I started, well, I mean, because I was studying the first year, and then from there I was putting what I'd learnt into use, and I was working on the Hospice Crew album, and through that when I'd met Taunts, he was like, oh, I wanted to record an album. Can you help me with that? So then I started recording his album at my house too. And then from there it just became a, a staple fixture. Like uh, when I met Reason, he actually was like, oh, well, can you help me do some recording too? And and that's that's really where I sort of 
develop good friendships with everyone was from doing recordings, helping with the mixing and stuff like that. And at the same time, I was learning my craft to get better. And that was, at those times, I wasn't charging to record. I was, I, I took it as a thing that I was learning my craft and getting better at it, cutting my teeth in the- in And building the actual, social currency. And that's it. That was it. And I was using sweat equity, as yeah. they call it. You yeah. Know, putting that work in. So, yeah, it took a while. It took- about three years of and doing that's that. when you started to form the high goons like as as we know them now yeah the high goons was we we were on tour in canberra launching the stormwater album and it was taunts bigfoot fletch rock hospice crew and art of war and while we were there we were, we were just sitting somewhere and i was like i've got this idea we should we should form a super crew called high goons like did you get the name from the simpsons i did <laughs> I yeah, the hide goons. Like, I didn't tell them at the time. <laughs> but, but Smithers is but like, I prefer the, the personal touch of hide goons. That's it, the hide yeah. goons. Hide goons, goons, hide goons. So at the time, I remember hearing that name and going, that's, that's actually a sick name for yeah. a rap crew. And I didn't tell everyone at the time because if I did, they probably would have written that off. But I was like, that's a mad name for a crew. It is, you know? yeah. yeah. And, it, and, it, and it suits the bringing everyone together as far, like you kind of like guns for hire sort guns of thing. for hire yeah. that's it so it know? works yeah. and it's a, i think as soon as if you tell them early days that it's off the simpsons mm. you might lose the credibility yeah. but as it goes on like who does people don't remember that anymore really do they some do, do yeah. yeah some do i mean that 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 scene springs to mind for a lot of people but the weird thing was i was actually watching bmx bandits recently um and i didn't like, my dad was the executive producer of BMX Bandits. Yeah, wow. Right? So, as a kid, he was in the movie industry. And as a kid, I used to love riding BMXs and stuff like that. And I loved the soundtrack. <clears throat> and I didn't realize, but it's like almost subconscious, that the bad guys in that film were constantly referred to as the goons. goons yeah. So, when I watched it recently, I was like, isn't that spun out? Like, Nicole Kidman going, oh, the goons. So, do you reckon that was subconsciously I think it there? was. Yeah. And I think then when I heard it, I was like, yeah, that's a mad name. I think I always liked the word goon. Like, even the, yeah, the goonies. Yeah. You know, stuff like that. It's it's weird. It's yeah. weird how things work, you know? It's it's good because it sounds menacing without being too... Like, if you're, like, the hired hitman or something, it sounds a little bit too aggressive. But Goons has a little bit of a playfulness to it as well. That's it. Like, a, I think a goon... There's a movie called Goon, which is... Because a goon is actually a, a <coughs> um, position in hockey, in ice hockey. Right. So the goon is the guy who's ready to punch on and barges people so it's actually a position that's played in ice hockey the the enforcer of of the team yeah right Mm. there you go you learn stuff from from this yeah i I didn't know that until i watched that movie (laughs) really yeah i watched the movie and was like oh wow so it's actually a it's a goon is a spot i just think of mobsters like you know what i mean that sort of thing yeah like you know but you're sort of stereotypical you know yeah they send the 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 heavy the, um, guys, the heavies. Yeah, the heavies. They send the, uh, what do they call them? The, the henchmen. The henchmen, yeah. yeah, that's it, man. Um, So, like, you're in Melbourne, you're, you're forming this group, you're recording. At what point do you feel like, all right, well, this is happening. Like, I'm fucking, we're making records. Like, I didn't, because that must have been a bit of a pipe dream when you're coming from, mm. from Canberra. Yeah. But then it sort of becomes a little bit, easier to do once you find the the like-minded dudes and that sort of thing mm-hmm. and you think fuck this is actually we're doing something here yeah. we're not just doing open mic nights we're making albums we're making records yeah that's it, it well the bigfoot and fletch rock had the taste of things to come cd that they put together and then it was just everyone had to put together a demo cd so me and new sense we wanted to go to adelaide i can't remember what the show was for but we wanted to go there to catch the show so we bought tickets to go fly to Adelaide. And before that, we, we acquired a whole bunch of CDRs that you could burn mm. and photocopied a cover that we'd written up and put stickers on it and tagged them all with Copic markers. So we had about 20 of these CDs. I can't remember if it was 20 or more. Might have been more. And then um, we basically just put that together, called it the Beer Money Sampler. And then we went to Adelaide, and then while we were there, we just started standing out the front of the venue trying to sell it, and all these people started buying it. And we were like, wow, we actually paid for our flights 
by so selling more than these. just beer. Yeah, <laughs> and the, I mean those things go for like two hundred bucks now. Yeah, so that, and it's that, a burnt that, CD. That, there are dudes bootlegging them. That, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, that's fucking crazy, isn't it? Heck, They're bootlegging what's essentially a bootleg. Like, yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. So that was, the, and I remember at the time. Then we got back. I was like, "Oh, maybe we'll release it." So we on the Oz Hip Hop forums, we, I just gave out my my postal address. I was like, and that was the time when there was no like PayPal. There was none of that. Yeah. There was money orders from the post office. So I was like, make a money order out to this name. Send the money order to this address, and I'll send you a CD with your address. Yeah, wow. And that I'd I'd wake up, go to work. Come back, and there'd be like six money orders in the in the in the post box at our house. Like I'd, I'd be like, "What?" I'd go in and go, "And you said, check this out." Like six more people just bought our CD, and we're just like bugging out. So we go and get more CDs and burn them. I think we ended up shifting like two hundred of those things or something yeah, like right. that. So that's where we just were like, "Yeah, we can do this, man. We can actually make a record label and do it." And then when I entered the MC battle. For the third year running, I ended up winning the competition mm -hmm. and a vinyl pressing was the prize and Mexi had actually just organized like a, a grant to press vinyl in Canberra and he got approved for that and, and it was under our name. So that was approved the day after I won the MC battle where I just won a vinyl pressing. So you got vinyl coming out your ass. Yeah, but we, <laughs> so we had the funding, funding for that yeah. grant to press vinyl, but we just won a vinyl pressing for free yeah so we used that funding to press cds and we put out taunts's album because mm -hmm. his was ready before stormwater and that was that was the birth of the label mm -hmm. and because i was studying sound engineering there was like a small business course involved in that which i didn't actually do good in at the time and then from there i started focusing more on understanding the business side of things as well and it was just from there just going around to all the different stores and Asking if they'd stock our CD and then the consignment run and stuff like that. So and then chasing crazy. for money, then that's the next step. Chasing. Well, that's the. I was talking with someone about this. How there's stores from back then that still have copies of Stormwater on vinyl. They might. I don't know, but they never paid me for them because they were consignment. Mm. Cause, so they there are stores that owe me maybe sixty bucks from twenty years ago, and if I can locate the paperwork and work out which stores they were and contact them if they still have those vinyls those things are going for 300 dollars a piece on ebay it's like it's a no-brainer what just pay me the 60 bucks dude yeah yeah you know i mean if i message them and go those things are worth this much just give me my 60 bucks yeah there's probably well, 600 give it back bucks to me and i'll me. fucking sell it yeah yeah you know yeah um well, yeah i guess and you you can it's still very D diy but you're doing it and i guess people are coming up to you at gigs and they're looking up to you and they're saying fuck man you're actually doing this shit that we're yeah. dreaming of doing and yeah. they're looking up to you and you're getting respect now mm. in the, in the scene as well mm. and yeah that and we were like wandering salesmen we had cds everywhere from really that point on. we had we always had cds and then it got to a point where mexi did hoodies and we, every show we were at we just had merch all yeah. the time and everyone was like oh man those hoodies are sick can i get a hoodie and we were just blown away that people were getting them you know mm. it was mad it was a real cool time like crazy like, yeah and and People still do buy merch for, for you know, like uh, your HG merch, you know, you see a lot of people yeah. wearing that. Yeah, yeah. And that's got to be, again, that sort of social ticket validation. You know, yeah. that they might be streaming your music, but they're still buying the merch, so it's all good. For you know? sure. That's that. I mean, that's the thing. It's like you you put it out, like at, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if people don't buy it. Like we, we can wear shirts for as long as we want. We got our own shirts. Mm -hmm. But if people are into it and they want to buy it, then they will. And it's it's always been a good thing that people actually do buy it and it's supported. It's, it's like I said, the metal, the metal scene is kind of like the blueprint for that because that's that's how it always was in the metal scene, mm. where people put out albums, they put out merchandise, and the the real core fans go, "I love this shit." But you don't want to overdo it though, do you? When nah. you're re-releasing stuff, you've got to make sure it's an anniversary or something. Otherwise, it just takes away from that limit, yeah. limited sort of. Yeah. yeah, that's it. Like when I when I repressed Stormwater. We had the, um, we had the dub plates for it, or the actual, the the pressing plates for it, the stampers. Yep. And that was after Murky had passed, and I was like, oh, we'll see see what it'll cost from Zenith if I can get these manufactured when we got the stampers. And he was kind of just bugged out that we had stampers. Yeah. So he's pressed them up for us, and then they sold pretty quick, and that was it. I wouldn't I wouldn't do any more yeah. represses, and that's a different version. 
because it has an image of Murky on it. It says rest in peace to him, you know? Yeah, and you don't want to overdo it like, oh, this one's the pink vinyl, this one's the blue vinyl, or all yeah. that sort of stuff because then you might be fucking over it, you know? Yeah, doing too much. Like, like for, for me as well, like this is the 20th anniversary of my label being founded and most of our catalog didn't come out on wax because once, once I got to a point where I had more artists that I was working with, the budget only could stretch so far. So we didn't really have it in the budget to press vinyl as well as CDs as much. So it was more focusing on getting CDs in the stores and doing that. So now 20 years on, I'm trying to make sure I can get some pressings done of some of those classic albums, yeah. but it's the financial outlay of pressing vinyl. But I'm it, sure you'll sell, and you could do the pre-orders and stuff. I think you'd be okay. Could, but it's, I don't like doing pre-orders too much. Like I'll, I'll, I'll put a post up and let people know that the, the test pressing's done you know, so it's like I've I've got money down, and it's I've I've invested in this. Mm-hmm. I don't like to do the pre order where it's like oh I haven't I haven't ordered them yet. Mm. You know, pay for the order, pay retail, and but I think people it. are happy to support man if they've been fans for twenty years. I, they I know, know they're happy to support, but for me it's like I'm I'm more like it's a moral stance for me. Yeah, it's like if I don't have the finances to outlay the cash one hundred percent straight away. Mm-hmm then fair enough. But I'll always make sure I've got 50% to lay down that deposit and then in order to pay off the rest of it, set up a pre-sale thing because by the time that's done and the the wax order's back, then I've got everything sorted. But as long as I've got the money there, then I'll do it. But I'm not really into doing GoFundMes. Yeah. I I could, Mm. you know, but me personally, I'd rather hit up the record manufacturer and be like look i've got a whole catalog of records i know these will do these sorts of numbers if we can manage to press them up but i don't have 30k to press up 15 albums yeah so how about we do a deal where you press them up you know i'd, I'd rather do that which they're probably once they see the first one do well they're probably more That's than it. likely going to do yeah that. they they might <clears throat> be interested in that but even then i, I haven't approached them because mm. i'd rather just work save up the money to get certain albums out that's why this year the albums that i was putting out were ones that i had put out myself because then i knew that i could recoup the costs from that and end up having that money go directly to bte so i had all that funds without having to split it with any other artist before putting out any of the other stuff yeah you know? uh, so then i'll recoup that coin yeah and it's like it's the smart and the and this level-headed way mm. to way to do it and that's probably why you won't get yourself in any sort of strife you yeah. know that way because it's safe yeah it's interesting now that man in 2023 that there's more of a demand for vinyl than there was in the 2000s crazy oh like and i guess it's changed because people were still consuming cds then mm. which now like i think cds will come back around because kids now they will, be, will for yeah sure. our kids now will be like wow look at this shiny disc yeah like you know what i think it will man they're selling discmans in op shops for 200 bucks it's, man it's bananas you know? i i i was at a pub in mornington the other day and these kids that were young i'm talking to them or whatever and they're taking a photo with like a 2000s digital camera yeah. and they're like look at this you can see it on the screen and like that's vintage to yeah. them i'm like it's fucking weird man yeah crazy eh? yeah yeah like so crazy like they, they wouldn't know what to do with old cameras where you like like <coughs> remember when you had to go to a chemist or a, a dry cleaner developed. and get it developed yeah you know? wow. i was talking to a uh, a dude today a, a writer and i said man like the old days when if you saw a panel you'd run to 7-eleven buy a dip- disposable camera and take a photo of yep. it because you're like we well, you don't see that every day so yep. you would do that and i just like imagine that now running to 7-eleven buying a camera and just you know when anyone everything's just bang right there and and i mean on top of that like when you were going to get your film developed at the same spot you go every week and you're painting and you're giving a fake name <laughs> And all that, and you're walking in, and it's like this was before there was like surveillance cameras everywhere, and the whole the paranoia of being like, oh man, I got to give a fakie yeah. in case they go, why is there pictures of vandalism on this? Are they going to share it with something? Like you go to pick it up, are you are you worried someone's going to be there watching you pick up these photos? Yeah. It's like so, such a different time now. It's like you just take it on your phone. Yeah, it's crazy. It's taking the anxiety out of the whole process. Yeah. Um, so you obviously live and breathe hip hop, and so you, everything you do is is within hip hop. So it's probably fitting that you also 
find love in hip hop as well. Mm -hmm. So you've got a partner who also is an artist. Yeah. Um, and you're doing a gig with her. You're are you mentoring her? Like, how does that sort of creative um, relationship work? We just build each other up. Like, I'm definitely not mentoring her at all. You mm -hmm. know, she she inspires me. I inspire her, and we just build together. Mm -hmm. So she's she's awesome, man. Viliani, she's the illest. And you're gonna do a gig with her in like the get down? Yeah, the get down. <coughs> um, oh, what's the date for it? Eleventh, I think. Eleventh of August. I think eleventh of August. Yep. Eleventh yeah. of August in Brunswick at the the Barty Room, the yeah, oh, the Bur the Burgie Band Room, Burgie Burgie Band Room. I'm pretty sure it's called. Yeah. So it's a new venue. That's Detour Flicks is mm -hmm. a, is the guy who organises that. I've Deets. got him coming on on the show eventually. Wicked. He's a real cool guy. He, look, I haven't met him personally, but he seems to really be passionate about he the really scene is, and yeah. got you know. And he's yeah, what he's doing it looks like he really gives a fuck. And yeah. so I thought he'd be an interesting guest to have on. Yeah, he's <laughs> a legendary character. It's cool. So we've been developing a bit of a friendship with him, meeting him and some of the guys from FAT, Fried and Tasty, mm -hmm. the Breaking Bread Mob and all those guys. Yeah, so they had a showcase a couple of days ago, I yeah. think, on Friday. Yeah, at Laundry. It's great dudes, you know. So It looked like it went off that gig, man. It did, yeah. Were you there? I wasn't, but man, I but saw. I, yeah. yeah. I was going to have some water. You're right. Nah, that, yeah, I'm good, man. I still got a bunch. I've dipped my toe into music production a little bit years ago, mm -hmm. so I know, understand a little bit of it, but I'm really curious to someone who does it full time like what you're what you're using mm -hmm. you know are you using an mpc using keys because i know that you do like you can do it all but if you're sitting down to make a beat what are you what are you doing you're finding a sample first are you finding the keys like what are you how are you going about that process it depends like sometimes i'll find a sample depends like recently i've just been making beats by just writing a drum loop and then i'll just break out the keyboard find a sound that i like the sound of just play and see what what I can come up with that I like and it just speaks to me and I'll be like that one's good mm -hmm. alright let's record that and then record it then I'll sit back for a bit and I'll be like what does it need now oh it needs that add a bit of bass play the electric bass synth just add stuff mm -hmm. you know so I've made like 20 beats in the last week that were just no samples the only sample that I used was record crackle yep. just to give it a bit of Authenticity, you know, a bit of just yeah, the depth, that, yeah. like just that crackly sound, just makes it's something about it. It just adds this element to it, you know, and it just just makes it sound like a sample, mm -hmm. you know. So that's what that's what I've been doing lately, and I've really been enjoying it. And then trying to make them a bit more sparse, you know. But then like I'll I'll make a sample based song, and it just the sample just speaks to me and tells me what to do, like mm -hmm. a, by what I do to it. Sonically, you know, with the gaps you've got to fill and that sort of thing. Yeah, like it's weird. It's like it'll, it'll like, because I don't like taking a straight sample and just using it as it is, like a loop, like say, staying alive baseline and just using that. I like to like say I sampled that, I then play it down on a different key or stretch it and listen to it and then, and then play like a bit of it on that key, a bit of it on this key, chop it, chop up. it up, do do all this stuff that. It does, like I think of the sample as a tone. I don't really think of it as a loop. I mm -hmm. think of it as a tone that I'm going to use as an instrument, and then I make a loop out of that tone. And then once once I've made that loop, and I'm like, okay, I like the rhythm that's giving me. I'll sort of sit back and listen to it, and it's it just sort of has like harmonics that's that I hear. Like it might be a record crackle in the sample that pops at a certain point, and I'll go needs something in that spot with that pop like might be a wah guitar or a little skank you know yeah. or something a screaming sound or something like it just speaks to me and and the more you add to it the more things start to meld together and then create harmonics that make you go that needs something there you know and um, but at what point do you know it's done that's one thing that i mm. always find like when do you know when it's finished you know and that must be a fucking tough part you know yeah sometimes you can overcook it you know, so for me, I know if it's a so if it's a beat that I personally want to write to, mm -hmm. I know it's done when I start writing. Yeah. When I go right, I got a lyric in my head. I'm doing it. If it's one that I'm gonna sell, it's one that I can't write to. Most times, I'll be like, I can't. I can't. 
I'm just not, it's not making me think of lyrics and it doesn't keep me right in the feels. It makes me go, I want to write a song to this. And it might, you might be making it think, oh, I know who this might work for. Yeah. So then you reach out to them, go, man, I made this. Yeah. I didn't have you in mind, but I reckon you could do something yeah. here. Yeah. And then I guess they either go, yeah, I'm just mm. fucking, I, I'm guessing most of the time they say, yeah, cool. Or sometimes they might say, oh, man, no, I'm not feeling that one. Or I'm not yeah, in the right you, space you, of mind. You really never know. Like sometimes you might make a beat with someone in mind and that it's based on the sound that you know them for. And then they're, they're like, no, nah, that's not that's not where I'm at at the moment. Mm. You know, they're trying to do something else. Yeah. So like, yeah, it's a funny one. And, and like sometimes you'll make a beat and it'll have all these changes and do all this stuff. And like I, I had one dude buy a beat off me recently and then when he came to the studio to record, he's like, I don't want this part of the beat in there. Can we cut that out and just use that one? And I was like, oh, sweet. Me, I thought that was just too, it was just a loop. So I switched it up and made it something else, put it through a filter, added some more instrumentation. He's like, I like that, but maybe have that as the outro of the song, mm -hmm. you know? And this is someone that you know? Like yeah, some, yeah. yeah, right. So he buys the beat off you and you, and so you say, yep, part of that is I'll come, you come and record it with me, we'll do vocals and all that. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a lot of time sort of consumed with that sort of thing well, as well. Well, when I sell a beat, I, base, I look at a beat as a skeleton, right? So it's, it's it might have like a bit of sequencing on the way the drums are, but... The artist then, if they buy the beat, they can flesh it out however they want. Mm -hmm. You know, they can remove samples, they can take parts out of it, they can resequence the way it is, reverse bits, whatever they want. If I give them the files, they can do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. You know, but if if they're working with me in the studio and then we're listening to it, when they lay vocals on it, then it's those post production things that I'll hear and I'll be like, yeah, okay, that needs this. It needs a needs a drum roll in that spot it mm -hmm. needs no drums in that spot it needs a different sound that isn't in any other part of the song right there it needs a sound effect here so when you know, they're col when you're collaborating with them are they also are you also giving them i guess feedback but are you saying like i don't know if that hook's right man or mm. like this needs more or are you just like okay you've Im you've bought the beat you've bought you've employed me to do this mm. and the creative thing's yours like yeah see that it's a hard one if it's a project that i'm working on with them together mm -hmm. then i give my two cents a bit more I, they'll always if they ask for it that's what that's one thing i've learned over the years if someone asks for your opinion then you give it if they're not asking for your opinion maybe don't give it mm -hmm. on a song. If I sell someone a beat and they've paid the fee for that beat and they've come and done something to it, well, i got to like that, what what they've done. I, I That's might, their art. Yeah, but not. I mean, nine times out of ten, I like everything they do, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And if they go, what would you add to it? I'd be like, I'd, I'd do this. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're recording it with me, I'm like, I'll be listening to it going, I think maybe you should do your, your backing vocal in a different tone in that section or maybe say these particular words underneath those words with a different effect on it in order to accentuate that part of the song you know mm -hmm. but it's like if it's if they have a vision and some artists have that vision and it's in their head and they just want me to make that happen for them mm -hmm. and other artists have a bit of a vision and then they're like mm, i don't know and i'll be like oh you know if i may what if you try this you know something as simple as when you're playing it back just like muting the beat on one word that it isn't on and then putting the beat back in and they'll, they'll be on the couch and they'll go that do that mm. and i'll be like do you want that in any other parts and they're like i don't know let's play it back because they never thought of it like that yeah but then when you play it back and you, it, to me it's a simple dropout mm. but to them it's like something they haven't thought of until they hear it and then their mind's ticking along going wow what else can we do to change it you know? but you'd think that majority of the people that are coming to work with you are also want your expertise as well that's why they're coming to yeah, you so sure. you're not really speaking out of school when you say hey man i reckon this needs more of this or that needs for more sure of that. yeah but i guess some people probably have the hook in their head and they're like well that's non-negotiable this is how it this is the song i want it that's yet. it sometimes sometimes <laughs> i'll take liberties and put an echo on something and then they'll be like take that echo off i don't want it mm. and then when when an artist's is like that, then that's in my in the back of my mind. I'm like, okay, don't don't put anything extra in unless you're asked for it with this artist because that they've got a vision in their head that that's how they want it. Mm. Or we'll have a discussion like, what do you want? What do you want me to do with this? Do you want do you want to just rock on the beat and then you tell me what you want done to it? But I'll always ask. I'll always be like, what what do you feel it needs? Mm. 
Yeah. And if they then ask for my input, then I'll give it. You know. And what, like, if you're selling beats that they're not going to work on with you, mm-hmm. they just there must be dudes that just want to buy that and they're going to record at another studio or yeah. at home or whatever. Yeah. And then do they send it to you? And then you you got to be like, well, sometimes they murder it. Like the like the this shouldn't have been done like that. But I guess you got to let your baby sort of go at some stage. I mean, um, most most artists that buy a beat off me will end up sending me the track that they've done to see what I think of it at the end. Which is sort of part of the process. Yeah, but sometimes it might take six years. Like one one guy hit me up recently with a track and was like, oh, I finally got this track recorded. And I'm like, I can't even remember who this is. Yeah. And then I'll hear it and go, wow, when did I make that beat? And I'll, even by listening to the drum sounds and what, and I'll be like, oh, I must have made that at this point when I was doing that. Mm -hmm. You know? And I mean, most times when I hear stuff, I'm like, man, that's really cool. Like, I'm I'm pleasantly surprised. Like a, there was a time when I was thinking I should just go work construction. Really? You know, cuz I was like going, oh man, some of the stuff that you you're selling your babies, you know, mm. with your beats, but then it was it got to the point where it's like, man, they're just sitting there. Yep. Like there's folders and folders. like I've got hundreds of beats just sitting in folders and I've managed to make it so I can pay my rent selling beats. Like mm. that's that's amazing cuz they would have just sat there gathering dust or me trying to find a way to put them out in the world. But then when you play them, sometimes you play a beat and someone will be like, that's the illest beat I've ever heard. And in my mind, I'm like, that's the worst beat I've ever made. Yeah. But, but you probably listen to it a lot of times. So, you don't, you know, you're hearing it nuances that they're not picking up on. For sure. And, and I mean, different people have different tastes. Yeah. That's the crazy thing. Like, you, you just never know what style someone's into. And it's, that's the whole thing. If you're trying to tailor make beats for people unless you have a unless you have a idea of what they want you probably miss the bar yeah. you know yeah, so yeah i'm pleasantly surprised with with what most people send back to me and it might motivate these people that these kids or some dude could be writing raps down all their life mm. and then they buy a beat from you which then actually motivates them to do this song that they've been talking yeah? about they may not release a whole project they may not even put it out to the world but they just wanted to do that one thing yeah and that's like, if they're buying it off you, they know that they've bought your tick of approval. You can, you can, they can send it to you and say, "Man, this is what I did," yeah. and that's something they can tick off. Yeah, for and, sure. And that's that's got to be something that you must be like, all right. Well, rather than sit in a fucking hard drive somewhere, let's put them out there to people. Yeah, hundred percent. That, that's what I mean. That when I when I made that decision and was like, "Yeah, I'll start selling beats because I've got so many," I didn't really think anyone would would do it would buy them you know mm. and you're getting local dudes and people from overseas yeah and, yep. yeah dude from ohio bought two beats just the other day you know i posted one on on instagram just that i'd just been working on and he's like man I'd, i'll i'll buy that if you're selling it really and i was like yeah and then he goes oh, i want to get this one as well and i was like no worries has he put them out is he put the, fu- the fu- oh i guess it's he two, only two. got them like three yeah, days yeah, ago okay, so yeah. it'll probably take another month or two so- before he gets them but before or before he puts them out but have yeah. you had anybody reach out and you're like, oh, I'm not really feeling this or anything like that? Not really. Like, I mean, it's a hard one. I'm I'm sure people have hit me up saying, do you want to work on something together? And I'm like, mm, it's not really my steez. But when it comes to selling beats, it's like, mate, if I'm if I'm selling beats, then that's that's the risk you take. Like Thanks, someone man. whose art you might not be into. Might want to buy that beat. Have people know? flipped them to the point that you're like, I never would have thought of doing that to that thing. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. And is that like a pleasant surprise or it's just like- Definitely, yeah. As a, as a producer, I like it because I'll, I'll hear it and be like, that's cool. Like I didn't, mm. I wouldn't have thought to do that. Yeah. And you know, it's that's what I mean. Like sometimes I'll make a beat, it might be a dark sounding beat, you know, and someone does a totally different sort of topic on it. Like yeah. in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, it's an angry nighttime topic. Yeah. And they do something totally different. And then when you hear it, you're like, that's what it was meant to be all along. Yeah. You know, and that's the beauty of it. Like you you release it out into the world and someone else finds inspiration from it and you just never know what someone's going to do with it. Yeah. And while that inspiration is a good segue, because I was going to ask you, so who inspires you from the production point of view, beat making? Like who do you regard as like the best at it or some of the best at it? Mm, I mean, Primo... He's my Alchemist. number one, I reckon. Yeah, Alchemist mm. is sick, man. Jest. I like Jest's production. Mm-hmm. Um, Farmer G's beats. I've been really digging the stuff that I've been hearing from him. So, and like dudes that I know, Taunts, Bigfoot, mm-hmm. Heater, banging beats, man. OT from Sydney, man. He makes some crazy stuff, you know. 
Phil Gector, Tram, mm-hmm. s- Must. Yeah. Like locally, there's, we've got so many world-class producers here. Yeah. It's incredible. And then overseas, it's, oh, man, the the list would be endless if yeah. I tried to write you, it. You, do you regard Primo as probably one of the best? I mean, when you hear a Primo beat, you can't you can't help but nod your head, nah, eh? Like, yeah. I can't think of one Primo beat I've ever heard that I didn't like. Yeah, even the, you like, know? forgotten beats or whatever they're called, the forgotten yeah. tapes, you put that on just instrumental and it's fucking sick. Yeah, man. If I'm having dinner or something, people yeah. come over, I put that on mm. and, and you just, yeah. You know, you know who's a sick producer? Freddie Fox. Really? Freddie Fox. And, like, I first heard him on Primo beats or on... Maybe a KG beat because he was a member of Flavor Unit, mm-hmm. and now he's been doing production albums, and his beats are sick, man. Mm. And you know he got schooled by Primo. Yeah, it's just got that nod. Like, yeah. so I mean, I can't think of a single Primo beat that isn't banging. Like yeah. even the stuff that he did for Christina Aguilera was banging. <laughs> yeah, he just has that sort of magic touch. Have you watched his YouTube series? Some of them, not all of them. I, yeah, I binge watch that stuff, yeah. man. I just it's just so cool when he he'll show the original floppy disk yeah. and everything. I love that shit, man. Yeah. Yeah, he I I think he's he's fucking amazing. Um so we've covered a lot of hip hop stuff, mm-hmm. but from like a personal level, if you weren't doing hip hop, what would you fucking be doing, man? Because I ask a few people mm. this sort of question, and they, and they generally are just like puzzled. They're like, "I don't know what I'd be doing." I probably have to say, "I don't know what I'd be doing either." Yeah, I, I, I which just, means that you're that fucking passionate about it. You know what I mean? It's just it's a part of me. Like I, mm. like I, I don't know. I, don't, I really don't know. Like, yeah, I mean, my life would have taken a totally different turn. Like, would I? Would I have been like a corporate driven? person would i i just don't know like Mm. i I, it's a really really hard question to answer like because because the things that i do are what make me who i am Mm -hmm. you know there's like a saying my dad would say which is you show me five of your friends or ten of your friends i'll tell you who you'll be in 10 years Mm -hmm. you know because you are what you consume you are who you are around you know so Mm -hmm. it's like i don't know i'd i'd I couldn't imagine my life without so, the things that I do. But is that is the life that you have now that you forge for yourself? Is that only possible in Melbourne? Like, obviously, it's pretty hard to have have that happen in Canberra. Mm. Is it? Would it be possible in Sydney? Do you think? You reckon? The- I think it. I think it is. I mean, the path that I took to get me here, I think there was hundreds of other people on the same sort of path. So we've all sort of done what we did to make everything what it is now and then there was hundreds before me Mm -hmm. that got it to a point where it was even remotely acceptable for people like me to Mm -hmm. build this path so i think i mean there are people in canberra making it Mm -hmm. you know doing their thing so i I think i think now it's easy for anyone to choose to do it the internet has changed that i think a lot yeah and the stigmas removed i mean i remember when they wouldn't play hip-hop in a burger shop Mm -hmm. You, you wouldn't you wouldn't have like hip hop getting played anywhere, not no. in stores. There wasn't graffiti in stores. Yeah. It's like a, a KRS one out of line graffiti isn't corporate because it gets no respect, hasn't made a million dollars for some corporation yet. And now it's in ads. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, and, well, and that's because people that are from our generation are in positions of power in advertising. And all, so they put hip hop yeah. into these. Well, like, you know, Primo, he, he's. Um, one of the gangster tunes is uh, the Bank of Melbourne ad. I know. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so when you hear that, which is still such a sick song, yep. um, and you hear that and you're like, wow, that, that is as, as co- a, a, one of the big four banks. So Bank of Melbourne is Westpac. Yep. Is like is pushing hip hop like yep. you know that it's gone ex- as mainstream as it's ever going to fucking get. was it? It was off Moment of Truth, um, wasn't it? Yeah. I'm, it wasn't Rep uh, Gets work, Bigger. Work, work. Work, that's yeah. right. Yeah. I remember hearing that and going, I think I even tagged Primo in it and was like, are you aware of this? You know? Like, it's funny, like, going into, like, you see JJ's jeans, they're selling two-pack shirts. I did and see the that, Chronic, yeah. and it's like- The, the Chronic, the, I almost bought that Chronic t-shirt. I walked past it the other day. I'm like, that's sick. I'm like- It's crazy. Is yeah. it licensed? It is, yeah. Because, yeah. How do they license that, that? You know? Yeah, it's just, it would go straight through some big corporation that just gives their little licenses out. Yep. Yeah. 
that, crazy. Yeah, and I guess they probably think, well, it's getting sold, licensed in Australia, the other side of the world. Like, who cares? Mm. But, yeah, man, fuck. And, like, I think, is it Inspector Deck? One of the Woo members is on fucking menu log ads now. Yeah, Inspector Deck. Yeah. That's right. yeah. yeah. So it's everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> crazy eh? yeah it's bananas man what with with like obviously you you love your sort of boom bappy kind of stuff but who are you who are you feeling at the moment from the aussie scene like who's new sort of coming not when i say new but from this new era of sort of mcs who are you really digging or producers i mean like I, i'm digging ot from sydney mm -hmm. toxoid um ruins bronx here from melbourne you know, I like I like that grimy style. You know, DOA's Steez, I like what he's doing. Yep. Um, I dig flows. You know, I think he's cool. I think he's a really important artist for the youth to hear. Yep. Um, all these dudes will be stoked that you shout them out as well. I reckon. Oh, I mean, I'm I'm stoked to have encountered these people. You know, yep. and and to meet like new generations of heads yeah you know and also like with the, the whole grime movement that's happening all over the world but that you're a part of that here to help sort of those guys mm -hmm. get a plat platform as well do you want to say anything about that is that like something that you're obviously pretty fucking stoked to be a part of man i mean i'm stoked to be a part of it like but i i played just a small role which was being there um when fracture and scotty and and the smash brothers were doing their thing and me not sort of because i didn't understand it it was very different to yep. th what I was into, mm -hmm. but I didn't. I didn't try and be like, no, nah, don't do that. I don't like the direction of it. This isn't what I'm into. Stick with the boom bap or whatever. I was like, man, do your thing. Like, I love. I love you coming with a different sound. It was something so different to what I was used to that it took me a while to get used to it. You know, yeah. and and I could see them creating, and I was like, I'm really digging what you guys are doing. It's not what I do. Mm -hmm. but it's what, what you guys do and I feel it. And to, to have seen where it took off, like, and the respect that they've garnered for it is mm. just amazing. Like, it's it's crazy. It's crazy. And then like, some you, of those- You know Smash Brothers did a song with Wiley. Really? It just yeah. never came out. See, that's another thing I was going to bring up. I had in my notes that I've basically fucking thrown away. Mm. But there must be a lot of tracks that people sit on. They have too much anxiety to put it out. Mm. They just decide not to or they don't have the cash or they just go, hey, man, I'm fucking over that. I'm now doing this and whatever. Andrew, I got a whole New Sense album sitting in the studio that never came out. And do you, you know? like, yeah. And so do you feel like sort of hitting these guys up and saying, man, do you want to ever do this? What are we going to do with this? What For yeah. sure, yeah. yeah. But, but it's like it's on, it's artists decisions you know mm. i was listening to songs just today that i recorded with how mm. from coolism years ago that i gave him beats and he the next day sent back like four songs on these yeah. beats and they never eventuated to anything but it's like you know artists if they want to put a if they want to put those songs out they always can but it's mm. like it's it's not on me to force no, but they've probably forgotten about some of them or they, they yeah. just moved on to other, other things, things as well they might not have felt the direction of where they were maybe the way the mix was sounding i know new sense is now married he's working so he's not it, it's not really his focus mm. you know he's more work work focused so i mean things change you know we, I'm, I'm sitting on a whole hide goons album that i'm just trying to finish off yeah but we've had that for like eight years just in the pocket yeah you know but even then it's like almost aged because it's yeah some of the references and to us they're old songs so it's like if i make a song this week i'll be like oh jeed for people to hear that but in my mind from a um label style perspective is i want to put that one out before i put this one out you mm. know even though i'm more excited about this one because you're wearing your label owner hat rather than the yeah so you've got to wear the different fucking hats and make sure That's everything it. goes cohesively but then it's like you have a new school artist that does a song today drops it tomorrow All right yeah and you know what i mean it's like whoa like and i could i'd be sitting on a whole album and be like oh which one do i drop first i don't know what like but that's like what we we're know. talking about earlier with the album like see people mm -hmm. the, of the new generation are like i've got a song i'm putting it out there yeah. where if you're more from the old school you think i need to build this body of work get the album out there and that's yeah. when we're ready yeah. but i guess sometimes people just don't hesitate and they just fucking do it i'm i'm more from the elk of um <laughs> just dropping an album that no one even knew I was working on. That's cool, just being yeah. like, yeah, here you go, here's the album. And if 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 it doesn't pop, doesn't pop. It's a nice gem that people can sit on. Like I, I recently just did a show for Vision, my first solo album or my first solo show in years, 
And it's like a, that was technically the launch for that album here in Melbourne, you know. Mm. And I put that, that's my favorite solo album. It's yep. like who knows how many people really paid attention to that album. There are some people that hear it and be like, man, when did you make this? Yeah. Yeah. But I guess when you stay so true to the, the, the art that you want to make, you're proud of everything, you know? Like there might be stuff you, I guess you listen to now and go from 10, 20 years ago and you go, oh, I wouldn't have done that now, but yeah. that's where I was back yeah, then. That's, that's and exactly if you don't it. pivot and follow trends, then you're always going to be proud of what you're fucking putting out yeah, there. Yeah, that's it. I, I think of music as like a snapshot. It's like a, it's like a sonic photograph of a time. So it's like, and if you, and if you torture yourself trying to touch up that photo forever, mm. then you're never really enjoying the image of it. And it's the same with music. It's like you take a, you, you take a time, and you put that, you know, you capture that moment. Could have been a bad moment. Could have been a good one. And that's what it is. And eventually, when it comes out and you hear it, you're like, ah, oh, that's. I yeah. remember what we were doing at that time. I remember where I lived. Well, Remember what, if, what shoes I was wearing. Yeah, you know? what I was thinking, what I was smelling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I, it's interesting though. But what do you feel about like these artists that are putting songs out and then editing them after they've put them out? Like that's a fucking. It's a weird time to be mm. in music now where people can do that. Yeah. Like you know, if you put an album out back in the day, that's out. That's always that's how it's going to be forever. Yeah. Now people artists are altering songs and changing how you you know that's fucking. It's a strange spot. It's weird because you can put a song out digitally and then you can make edits back in the studio and then you can re-upload the audio to your digital aggregator and as long as you have the IRSC code and you put that in for the song, it then maintains all its stream numbers and all the counts yeah. so you can change it however you want. You but could... it's like I think if you're going to do a digital album and then you might make some additional stuff, you might go, oh, you know, I wish I put cuts on that song and then you put cuts on it and drop it as a, as a vinyl or a CD, then I think I've got no problem with that, you know. Mm -hmm. But I think if you put it out digitally and then you just re-upload it digitally and it's just like, oh, you're constantly touching up a song, I think it's... But it, it's it's a strange one, isn't it? Yeah, you wouldn't you wouldn't go you know you wouldn't go change the look of the face on the Mona Lisa after you've put it up in the in the yeah, gallery. Yeah, you've got to let know? it go at some stage. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, you but do. it's a, it's a it's a strange time to be alive that people are fucking doing. It that. really is, yeah, for sure. And I and it probably <laughs> are people and also people taking their catalogs down or whatever, which mm. is another thing that happens. They're like, nah, I'm taking my shit off there. Yeah. And that's why I think probably CDs are going to have a big resurgence because well, people will start to realize we might use Spotify or whatever streaming service, but you don't own this stuff. Nah. And if that gets taken down for whatever reason, then you don't have it. Yeah. That's like, it. can you, like, uh, I think it was <clears throat> because of licensing, Dallas Soul had pretty much none of their music on streaming services, mm -hmm. which means a whole bunch of kids never would have heard that I stuff know, yeah. at all. Yeah. You know? For sure. I think um, Bruce Willis was trying to take Apple to court because he realised after a while that all the music he'd been collecting, he didn't actually own. That he'd been, down oh, he'd been right. downloading it and it was their format and it was saved on their device. And then it, I remember reading about it going, fuck, that's bizarre. And that's why physical realm, I'd, ra I'd rather have, like if I move house, I've got to dedicate like a whole truck worth of, you know, a whole van worth of uh, moving to just my music collection, Yeah, you know? And some people are like, oh, I can't handle having all that physical stuff. Like, but they'll regret it one day. Man, it's that, that's the whole thing. It's... The Dude. CDs, whenever I go to op shops and stuff, which I love to do, mm -hmm. I always look at the CDs Same. and people, man, for two bucks, you might get a classic album right. that's sitting there that someone's gone, I've got Spotify, fuck this yep. off. 100%. Same as books. Mm. You know? Find some crazy books for four <clears throat> bucks. Man, there's so I, I look I look at books and I'm like, because obviously you can find a lot of images on the internet, mm -hmm. but there's photos in books that would never have been digitized, Yeah, you know, that no one's taken the time yeah. to do that. And if you're trying to make some art down the track and you've if th those photos aren't on the internet, you've got something that's fucking original. Yeah, 100%. We live in this fucking throwaway age, man, where, pe yeah. where people just don't want it and they want to declutter yeah. it. Yeah, but I think people, are, like like you said, like they're, they're starting to crave a physical aspect of that. Like it's because it's a whole element to like you, like music. You can hear it, but like it, there's there's a different element when having a physical release where you actually are touching the cover, you're reading it, like. 
Like as an engineer, I'm like reading it going, okay, who engineered this album? Who mm. mixed it? Okay, oh, wow, what did that, that guy mastered it? Okay, who, oh, wow, who's this engineer? What else did that person yeah. do? Like, I think till recently know, Spotify, you couldn't even really do that. There's no like, line As somebody yeah. who's really interested in, in music, you want to see who the sample is. They, they're, they're not going to fucking yeah. tell you that. Yeah. And that's another thing with the music stuff. If you own the physical copy, you there's stuff that probably will never – be digital yeah. because they've jacked the beat or whatever, especially from mm. early Aussie stuff. That'll never be on streaming services because yeah. they don't have those beats. And what about like the, the radio edit version and then the, the clean and then the dirty the version? Dirty version, yeah. Like I remember there was a channel live, that song um, Free Mumia, and there was two versions of it and it blew my mind when I heard the second version of it. And Especially it, when you're into production, yeah. you buy those singles, right? And they've got in, like instrumentals and acapellas on there, so you know you can you can use those, and and you're probably a lot less likely to be pulled up on sampling those than the actual fucking full chunk of the song. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's it's sad that uh, that physical stuff is sort of slowly disappearing, but it's cool to see that people are buying records again, and mm. hopefully CDs come back. Well, that's the thing: the, the newer generation coming up are starting to get into the physicality of it because they realise that there's a whole different aspect that they're missing out on. The interactivity: you can download an album and forget that you got it, yeah, and then one day you go, "Oh shit, I forgot I had that album," and it's, it just becomes background music. Whereas I can put on a song from any album from the last 20 years of my life that I bought the CD on and I'll play the CD and I might not have heard it for 15 years mm. and I know every lyric. Yeah, and that's because you you had that in your car or something or you listen to it on repeat in your Walkman or whatever. Shit. But it's also cool when someone comes to your house or they'll come to my studio spot or whatever, they look through your records. Yeah, yeah. Like they're not going to come and go, let's fucking scroll through your playlist. Yeah, yeah. So that's another Yeah, give me your phone. Let, <laughs> let me look at your music <laughs> folder. You know? yeah. yeah. But so that's another thing that I think is important with that physical stuff. Yeah, same with photo albums. Yeah. You know, old school photo albums that you open and you flip in the page. Like it's very different to just giving some thumb work. Yeah. You know, very different. And it's like you forget images that you've taken on these phones. Because like we are talking about before with the disposable cameras and stuff, now yeah. you'll take a photo, you screenshot stupid shit you don't want. You look through your photos, you're like, I don't want all yeah. this crap. 500 screenshots, Shots. why do I even take them? Yeah. What are they for? For, yeah. What was I planning to use them for? Like now I've got to spend two hours of my time erasing them, them. so I can save more space so I can take more useless screenshots. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> to go full circle. Crazy, yeah? Yeah, it's bananas. What a time to be alive. And I thought there'd be flying cars by now. 2020 oh, man I, it was the other day um back to the future was on and, and oh. they got a few th back to the future too they got a few things right there yeah. is no flying cars yeah the video calls i think a lot of people saw that coming it's getting there but uh the voice activation televisions and all that yeah. sort of stuff when they have that pizza hut the the Think pizza that just is it's like appears out of yeah. nowhere that'll be pretty cool do you know what still happens now that i i really i have to think is that really a thing 3d printing stuff like mm. i think that's a technology that's i don't know much about but you think that's fuck some futuristic it's crazy shit. like i mean remember total recall where yeah. he walks through the thing and it shows his shows his um his skeleton yeah and now you go to the airport and they got the full x-ray body scanners you yeah know? it's like whoa like like it, you know is it art imitating life or life imitating art or was it all planned out or is it people you know i think there's a company called cyberdyne mm. that makes like robotics and they made the terminator arm yeah it's like why would you watch a movie like that and try and make that thing that yeah. You know? Well, I guess it's a true. warning. Yeah. <laughs> and know? the whole I, the AI thing, man, it's, it's like a, it's, I don't know. Look, you can't say that it's no good because then you're mm. just being somebody who doesn't embrace technology. It's yeah. like someone in the mid 90s going, this internet thing sucks. Like, we just have the stuff there. You got to deal with it. Yeah. That doesn't mean you got to love it. It's a tool. I mean, you can use you can use a hammer to build a house, or you can use a hammer to hurt someone. Yep. Like, yeah. Yeah. So it, it all comes down to the, um, person wielding it and their intentions and how to wield it. And that's the, like, I mean, I've always spoken out about, like, how technology can be used for evils, you know, surveillance and, and the invasive nature of it, but I understand how amazing some of this technology is. Mm -hmm. But it's it's that whole thing of, like, insidious people might be using them for, like, bad means, mm -hmm. you know, so whether or not they're developed for that, 
or whether they're developed for the good of humanity. Who knows? But there's always going to be some evil buggers using it for some bad shit and some greedy capitalists that are going to go, oh, well, now we got AI. We Why would we pay an artist? We'll just get AI to generate a Jay-Z type song yeah. and then we'll create a fake artist in AI and, and we'll make billions of dollars off a robot. There was a dude yeah. who got a fake AI artist signed for a little bit, then he got dropped or whatever. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> but that's just bananas. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. I mean, that's what I mean. That's the nature of the world we're living in where people are interested in paying money for that, but they won't pay money to buy your cd <laughs> you know what i mean so like, it's so biz- it's so bizarre mm. like it's just that that yeah that fake fake humans have more currency in some respect than real humans mm. and it's enough to make you want to go fuck this i'm just gonna go move to the country and just you know what i mean man the older i get the more i understand hermits eh? yeah the more i do the more but, people i deal with the more i realize why hermits became hermits yeah, and I think, but you've also got the hindsight of being of lived your life and done stuff that you wanted to do. Mm. So I think as everyone gets older, they seem to think maybe moving to the country is all right. You mm. know what I mean? I've, we've moved down the peninsula, and I think I've had peeps of fun. I just want to chill. Yeah, out. Yeah, that's now. it, hundred percent. There's only so many clubs you can go to before you're sick of being at a club. You know? Yeah, man. And then you, that's when I moved to St Kilda. I wanted to be where the party was. Yeah. And then as I got older, I was like, ah. Oh, I just want to stay home. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Pay enough of money on rent. I'm going to stay here. Get just, my money's worth. Get my money's worth. Yeah. And it's funny, like, in your 20s and stuff, you pay all this. Like, if I would never stay home. Mm. Like, never. You'd be out every yeah. night. Like, what would you do at home? Man. Yeah. It was like COVID. When we were told to stay home, I was like, no, I'm going out. Yeah. But then, like, now, they're like, oh, you can go out. I'm like, no, I'm staying home. Staying home. home. But I think, <laughs> I think everybody that has, like, a, a graffiti background already has – uh, fuck you to authority yeah, yeah. in them. Yeah, for sure. So that's where that comes from. Yeah. I want to stay home because I want to stay home. I don't want to stay home because you told me to. Yeah, yeah, 100%. That was exactly it. That's, yeah. Yeah. But then, yeah, and then you get the opportunity to go out and you're like, oh, I really like staying at home. That's it. The party's at home. It's on the couch with the cat. Chilling. Yeah, well, I guess everyone gets <laughs> old, man, and everyone just, yeah, wants to, wants to chill out and wants to take it easy. <laughs> that's it, man. Um, oh well, thanks, man. I really appreciate you coming in. No worries. Chat. Thank you for having me. It We've was a great spoke chat. for a couple of hours, and it's I'm stoked. And we could probably keep talking, but we might run out of some footage. No, nah, but man, you, man, when I get my new studio set up, I'd love you to come in and have a chat again. Easy, man. I'd love to. I appreciate it. Cool. Thank Legend. you. Thank you. Cheers, man. Three thousand.